Okay, folks, it is February 23rd and we are beginning our council agenda. Um, just to let people know there is a uh, heritage hearing uh, at the beginning, almost at the right at the beginning of our meeting, and we have a public hearing tonight. So welcome everybody. Nice to see all of my uh, colleagues on council uh, with us um, and uh, those who are watching from home and our wonderful staff. Thank you very much. I'm going to begin. I'm going to call the meeting to order and we're going to go through our councillors beginning with uh, District 1 Councillor Kathy Daigle-Gammon. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> uh, representing District 1, Waverly, Fall River, Muscadaba Valley and all the beautiful communities in between. All right, thank you. Councillor David Hensby in the dark. How are you today, sir? Uh, good, more, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. I'm here in my sunny kitchen with the backlight of the natural light behind me, so I don't need to have any artificial light in front of me. So I'm here in the bright, sunny kitchen of my home. Thank you. All right, I'll take your word for it. Uh, Councillor Becky Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I am here in the beautiful District 3, um, Dartmouth South Eastern Passage, and looking forward to some good debate. Awesome. Councillor Trish Purdy. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and all my colleagues and everyone else. Um, happy to be here representing District 4, Cole Harbor, West Hall, Cherrybrook, Lake Loon. And I just want to give a shout out to Melissa and Michelle from Metro Turning Point and Shelter Nova Scotia. They took time out of their busy day to give me a tour today and just explain mm -hmm. how they did due to COVID and their mission and their vision. And they just do amazing work. And I also want to announce um, our first live virtual event coming up on Friday on my Facebook page, Trish, Trish Purdy District 4 to commemorate African Heritage Month and we have four amazing community leaders on the panel to talk about their experiences, their stories, their wisdom. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that <laughs> Friday night. Thanks everyone. That's great. Thank you. Councillor Sam Austin. I'm here, Mr. Mayor, ready to go. The sun is bright here in Dartmouth. Awesome. Councillor Anthony Mancini. Mr. Mayor, good afternoon and colleagues. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I want to send congratulations to uh, Premier McNeil. Thank you for your service, uh, Premier. To the new Premier, uh, Ian Rankin, uh, we look forward to working for you. Hopefully the uh, red team and the blue team and the orange team will get along just fine, uh, all for the sake of the citizens of Nova Scotia. Cheers. Well, isn't that a nice thought? <laughs> it's good to have hope, uh, Mr. Mayor. It's good to have hope. Oh, awesome. you partisan guys, come on. <laughs> Councillor Way Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, speaking from the uh, heart of beautiful District 7 Halifax South Downtown, I thought what uh, Tony was going to say there was uh, show me the money, but uh, but I'll take what he said. That was good too. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Lindell Smith. Mr. Mayor and colleagues, good afternoon. Happy to be here. Look forward to the meeting. Right on. Councillor Sean Cleary, District 9. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, and good afternoon to colleagues and folks in Halifax. You can see the life sculpture, uh, which is Joseph Trapel's uh, commissioned work from Ben's Bakery back in 1968, still on Quinpool. Uh, this is looking at it from the parking lot out towards the street. And we have lots of natural and artificial light here. If Councillor Hensby needs any, I can send some his way so we could see his beautiful mug. All right. Yeah, let's call it that. Uh, Councillor Catherine Morris. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good afternoon, colleagues. Um, pleased to be here representing Halifax Bedford Basin West, better known as Fairview Clayton Park in Rockingham. Looking forward to the meeting. Awesome. Councillor Patty Cuttle. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Hello, everyone who's watching online and my fellow colleagues. Um, I'd like to give a quick shout out to Brendan McGuire, the MLA for Halifax Atlantic, who's just been appointed the new Minister of Municipal Affairs. Um, I look forward to continuing to work with you, Brendan, on all kinds of issues important to our district and important to our city. Indeed, thank you. Councillor Iona Stoddard. Good afternoon, colleagues, Mr. Mayor. I would like to um, give a shout out to our district, District 12, 
Lakeside, Timberley, Beachville, Clayton Park West, and Wedgwood. And I'd also like to congratulate our MLA as being um, elected the new premier. So that's really exciting for this district. Thank you. Hello. Councillor Pamela Lovelace. Hello, colleagues. Um, coming to you live from Hannah's Plains, St. Margaret's District 13. Great to see you all. Uh, I would just like to invite you uh, to uh, a fabulous evening uh, on YouTube presented by EBC The Meeting Place in Upper Hammonds Plains. A uh, courageous conversation about racism to uh, to mark African Heritage Month and you can go to their YouTube page to listen into that conversation from community members in Upper Hammonds Plains. Thank you, sounds good. Councillor Lisa. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and uh, good afternoon to all of my colleagues. Yes, I'm getting to you in a minute. Uh, just wanted to say uh, hello to everybody in District 14 and uh, welcome to the zoo. Thank you. You really shouldn't let angry constituents into your house, uh, Lisa. <laughs> oh, and he is angry too. <laughs> Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon everyone from Lower Sackville. I would like to uh, continue the uh, trend that uh, Councillor Cleary started. We have, uh, for those who are interested, we have plenty of raw material for snowmen here in Lower Sackville for sale. Um, it's it's only $25 a ton, uh, pick up only. You have to bring your own conveyance for it, uh, but uh, we have plenty here if you would like some. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Tim Outhith. Hello, Mayor, and th hello, colleagues from uh, from uh, District 16, Bedford, Wentworth, now home of the Deputy Mayor and now the Deputy Premier as well. So looking forward to our discussions today. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. We've heard from both our legal uh, uh, counsel, John Traves, and our CAO. Um, yeah, it is a big day in Nova Scotia whenever a new uh, uh, government, a new, a new Premier and the Cabinet are sworn in, so we Congratulate everybody uh, who's been uh, sworn in today. Um, certainly the new Premier has many connections to HRM in the past and uh, in the present. Um, and we wish him the very best as we wish all of our uh, colleagues in the uh, provincial legislature and federal parliament. Um, and Brendan McGuire, yes, as Minister of Municipal Affairs and also Jeff McClellan, who is gonna be the Minister of Housing and Infrastructure <coughs> as well with whom we will have some serious uh, discussions. All right, uh, we have no minutes to- Before we get any further, Mr. Mayor, can I make one quick announcement? Uh, tonight is the beginning of the fifth uh, uh, Black, uh, Halifax Black Film Festival. It's online and make sure you get on to watch some of the great films that are available. The one I'm looking forward to is Bone Crusher, the story of Sam Langford, the, the legendary boxer from Nova Scotia. Indeed, thank you for that. Uh, we move to the order of uh, uh, business. A couple of notes before I go to councillors. Um, the heritage hearing <coughs> will begin right after we uh, approve <coughs> our agenda. Um, we will do the heritage hearing, I think, Ian, before we actually do the deferred business, correct? Mr. Clark? Yes, yes, yeah. please. So we'll do the heritage hearing before we go to number uh, seven. I also want to say that we have um, a presentation as part of the uh, integrated uh, tourism master plan and in, uh, in, in, in terms of providing certainty to the presenter Ross Jefferson and his team we've indicated we would do that at around 315 when we come back uh, from the break to try to get through. Everybody's okay with that? Seeing no uh, violent opposition. Um, with the agenda sir I'd like to have info item number three to be added to a future agenda meeting. About Very the William Porter crosswalk. Information item number three will be brought forward. Councillor uh, Austin. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I would like to remove uh, 11 point, uh, I think it's two, the Micmac Mall future growth node. Uh, has had second thoughts on that one. So that's 11, 11 point. point. 11.1.2, the request to initiate a master neighborhood planning process for the future growth 
Nick Mac Boulevard and Horizon Court. Councilor Austin is moving that be taken off the agenda. Is everybody okay Second. with that? Seconded. Can, can I, I, can I that removed indefinitely or just to defer to a future meeting? No, it's taken off indefinitely. Okay. Councilor Mason? I hear you. That's it. I'll second that. Thank you. Uh, we'll just go by a, a vote uh, by hand. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So that is removed from the agenda 11.1.2. Uh, Mr. Clerk, anything else on the uh, agenda? Uh, there are no additions from to the agenda from our office today. Thank you. OK, does somebody want to move the uh, order of business as amended? I'll so moved, Councillor Russell. Moved by Councillor Russell, seconded by Councillor Purdy. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We have something to work with. Consent agenda. Does somebody want to move the consent agenda? I'll, I'll move that, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Austin. Councillor Austin. Clear and second. The consent agenda is moved and seconded. If there's no other discussion, we have a vote on that. Beginning with District 8, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. Yes. Thirteen, Councillor Cuddle. Eleven, but yes. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle, sorry. <coughs> Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. Yes. Thirteen, Councillor Lovelace. That would be me. Yes. <laughs> District 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Outhead. Voting yes. District 1, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. 2, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. 3, Councillor Kent. In favor. 4, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes. District 5, Councillor Austin. In favor. 6, Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. 7, Councillor Mason. Councillor Mason. Mayor Savage. In favor of the motion, so that is the consent agenda. So I'll just read the items are 11.1, .1, which is the uh, amendment respecting streets and proposed administrative order respecting Boulevard Gardens, um, Boulevard Gardening Public Right Off Way Bylaw Amendments, and 11.4.1 .1, coming out of the Harbor East Marine Drive Community Council is the Dahlia. Oak Creighton Active Transportation Connections. Those two items are deemed to be moved by consent. Councillor Mason's back with us. Uh, you supported the consent agenda. I think we we didn't hear it at the time. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Calls for declaration of conflicts of interest. Motions of decision none. At this point, colleagues will move to item number eight. We'll come back and pick up 7.1, which is deferred business. But item eight is the Heritage hearing. This is on case H00479, request to include 6215 Coburg Road, Halifax, in the registry of heritage property for the HRM. Um, before we go to uh, staff, um, just want to thank people for joining us today for this virtual public hearing, Her heritage hearing, pardon me, heritage hearing. The order of events for this virtual hearing will be similar to the regular heritage hearing. We will start with a staff presentation and then give the property owner an opportunity to present via phone. As a reminder to council and to those watching from home, at a heritage hearing, only the registered property owner can speak or provide correspondence to council. So we're going to begin with a staff presentation, and I think we have the inimitable Jesse Morton with us. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me well. It looks like the clerk has pulled up the, the PowerPoint there. Um, Go ahead. OK, perfect. So this is the heritage hearing for heritage case 479, which is 6215 Coburg Road in downtown Halifax. And this uh, registration request stems from an application by the property owners, uh, Matthew Havenga and Daniel Smith, who will be speaking shortly. Uh, next slide, please. So just as a general reminder, whenever HRM receives a heritage registration application, the Heritage Advisory Committee scores that application uh, in accordance with the following six criteria. So each criteria has a maximum score for an overall value of 100 points. So if the Heritage Advisory Committee gives a score of 50 or more points, it moves forward to Regional Council with a, a positive recommendation. Next slide, please. So this slide provides some context to the subject site that you can see here in the red box. So it is located on the north side of Coburg Road on the block bound by Lamargin Street to the east and Walnut Street to the west. Uh, for another point of reference, it's across the street from Dalhousie Studley Campus. Uh, the property itself contains a two story wooden dwelling that was constructed in the late 1800s. Uh, next slide, please. So the first scoring criteria is age. So uh, when staff did some research, we found that this property was once a component of John and Mary Watts original estate lands. Uh, following Mr. Watts passing, the estate was subdivided and sold. Uh, so in 1886, we know that Charles Fraser purchased a double lot for $350. So at that time, that price point would suggest the two properties were vacant. And then here on the left, you'll see the fire insurance plan from 1889 that shows the dwelling exists at that time and as such staff know that the dwelling was constructed sometime between 1887 and 1889. Next slide please. In terms of architectural importance, uh, the dwelling was constructed during the Victorian era where uh, architects and designers were really striving towards vibrant buildings that made a very uh, grand visual statement. Um, the dwelling is constructed in accordance with the Second Empire architectural style. Uh, as you can see by its defining feature, the mansard roof. So this is a flat or a low pitched roof with very steep sides leaving to learn. Going down to the eaves. Um, there's other Second Empire traits on this property as well, such as the, the square rectangular shape, the intricate details, which you can see throughout the facade and the side hall entryway. Next slide, please. In terms of the property's construction, uh, the building has a balloon frame, which uh, emerged in the mid 1800s here in Nova Scotia when standardized building materials uh, started being produced at a, a more rapid pace. So this balloon framing is characterized by continuous wooden studs that run vertically uh, from the foundation to the top of the wall, and they are connected to the four joists by nails. So given the date of the construction of this property, we know that it's a, it's a mid to late example of balloon frame construction. Next slide, please. In terms of its architectural merit, again, it's a, it's a relatively late, but uh, very representative example of the Second Empire architectural style. Um, around Halifax, you'll see many uh, dwellings in this style that share similar features. Of course, the the mansard roof is some. Some of the other features include the the two two story bay window uh, that flanks the entryway. Uh, there's decorative corbels throughout the the property as well. The property has several other character defining elements, uh, including the the grand front front entryway here that you can see that's flanked by transom windows and side like windows. There's also a single dormer directly above this entryway. Next slide, please. In terms of the property's architectural integrity, um, its general shape and appearance and elements are as they were originally. Uh, they remain fairly well. In there have been some alterations though that, that are worth noting. A significant alteration would be the uh, installation of new vinyl windows that have modified and non-traditional dimensions into the, the second story bay, which you can see here on the left. So it does impact the integrity and the overall uh, appearance to some degree. 
Uh, a couple of the other changes include vinyl windows on the eastern wall, which a previous uh, property owner installed. And there's also a rear addition and deck, which you can see here on the right, that was installed around 2009. And, and this latter feature doesn't have a, a huge impact on the property's overall heritage value as it's in the rear and it's uh, not easily visible. Uh, next slide, please. So criteria six is the relationship to the surrounding area. So the, the property does sit prominently on the north side of Coburg. It is amongst uh, what once was large estate lands that were sparsely developed. But to, today it is characterized by a series of late Victorian dwellings that share many common features in terms of massing and architectural details that really add some, some good character to the area. And the dwelling again, which is uh, maintains much of its original appearance is also complemented by several nearby Second Empire dwellings as well, like the one you can see here on the bottom. Next slide, please. So in summation, this slide outlines the Heritage Advisory Committee score. You'll see that the property received strong scores for its relationship to the surrounding area and its architectural importance. Um, less strong scores for the architect and builder, which uh, we couldn't really verify and the integrity as we mentioned. So overall the HAC gave it a score of 58 points. So next slide please. With this score in mind, the uh, recommendation before you today is that Regional Council approve the request to include 15 Coburg Road Halifax in the Registry of Heritage Property for the Halifax Regional Municipality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Morton. Uh, much appreciated. Are there any um, questions of clarification from council? If there are, this is where they would have those. If not, we will open the heritage hearing. And uh, I want to invite the property uh, owners to address uh, council. So um, I have two names here, uh, Matt Havenga and Daniel Smith. I invite Matt and Daniel to speak, uh, Matt and Daniel, if you will press star six to unmute your phones. Uh, the clerk will uh, give you some instructions if necessary, and you will have up to 10 minutes. So Matt and Daniel, are you with us? Yes, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. This is uh, Mike Savage and uh, council is here. Is that Daniel or Matt? This is Daniel. Yeah, unfortunately, Matt uh, is an inpatient psychiatrist and something urgent kind of came up on the floor there. So he had planned on uh, joining us today, but he is otherwise occupied. So sounds important. So uh, that's fine, Daniel. Okay. So go ahead. All right. So I'd like to uh, start off by thanking uh, the council for considering our house uh, for uh, inclusion in the heritage property list, as well as all the staff at the Office of uh, Planning and Development who work in uh, heritage there. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm my family's been in Halifax for like generations and generations. I was born here, grew up in Truro, but I've moved back in, uh, in 2000. Um, we uh, we found this house uh, when uh, my partner uh, got into residency here, and we knew we'd be staying in Halifax um, for an indefinite period of time. So we started looking for a home. And uh, actually, it's kind of funny that we're here because uh, when we first started, we were looking at more modern, modern kind of minimalist homes. But uh, we we liked the look and the, the location of this house. And um, the first day we saw it, uh, we fell in love with it immediately. Um, it was really the unique character of this house. I've been in a lot of, you know, I've rented a lot in Halifax in my time here. And a lot of the houses have similar features. But this really kind of had, was a lot more unique, just a lot all the detail work, um, uh, the tall ceilings, the uh, big, you know, everything about it. Um, plus, it was very well maintained. It just seemed like, you know, it, it was well, you know, well taken care of by the people who owned it before, um, like a lot of the other houses I've lived in. And, and most importantly, we just saw a lot of potential here. So gone from, uh, you know, very modern to loving a Victorian home, which uh, which brings us here today. Uh, when we when we bought the house, we didn't really know how old it was. We assumed it was, you know, 1800s. Uh, um, but when we, we started uh, doing some um, restoration on the inside, uh, particularly our living room, dining room, 
Uh, we've been working with, we work with a designer, a local designer, Heather Waugh Pitts to, uh, our goal is to update the interior freshness, um, but still maintain like the Victorian character of the home while still being kind of a bit more modern. Um, when we took off the uh, wallpaper in the living room, we found uh, a bunch of different wallpapers, but underneath that on the plaster, we found uh, different dates um, signed when they had put uh, the wallpaper up. And the oldest one we had found there was 1891. So that's when we first realized how old this house was. And um, that kind of got us thinking, well, maybe down the road, we might want to register it as a heritage property. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we've uh, done some a, a lot of interior work you know, updating paints, you know, picking out new wallpaper that kind of keeps the character of the home, like a, a modern take on the damask wallpaper, um, kind of paint throughout, uh, and uh, just general kind of updating. Um, and uh, going forward here, um, our, our plan really, uh, what we'd love to do next would be to restore the, the house externally. Um, and uh, unfortunately, kind of, we had started our our bed, uh, some, the windows and all that stuff upstairs before our consideration of the heritage property. So, uh, as you, as they mentioned previously, uh, there was uh, the windows weren't quite in keeping with the initial design, and kind of regret that now because I, I do see it. But I, I think we can probably, once we've repainted the exterior, minimize that look. Um, but what we'd really like to do is restore the facade of the house. It's it's, it's an old house, 130 years old, um, and a lot, you know, it's all the original, original woodwork, and it's beginning to show its age, um, particularly the front uh, entryway, doorway, is beautiful, um, beautiful stained glass, um, or it's not stained glass, but with the little irony metal things in it, um, that we'd like to just restore that, um, get the door, um, and then the, the What's it? Thing that goes over the front of the door, porch. Um, just uh, uh, rebuilt to kind of uh, back to its initial character, uh, as well as uh, repaint the house uh, going forward, working with the uh, Heritage uh, Planning Committee to restore that and kind of bring it back to uh, what it might have looked like in its day and, and really be a, an asset to Halifax. And, um, just look really nice. So uh, thank you very much for your time. That's it. Unfortunately, I, I was going to have a PowerPoint with some pictures in it, but I thought we were doing it through Teams, and I found out um, yesterday that uh, it was by phone, and I had to have the presentation in yesterday. So I apologize for that. So that's that's it. Um, so thank you very much for your consideration. Thank, uh, thank you, Daniel. And I'm sorry that we couldn't accommodate those uh, pictures. I think it would have been nice to, uh, to see them, but I very much appreciate uh, what you've told us and the picture that you've painted off the place. So, um, thank you. Is there any questions of clarification of staff? Or counts or if, uh, from council? If not, I'll ask for a motion to close the heritage hearing. Move uh, heritage hearing closed. Councillor Mason Second. moved. Seconded, Second. Second. Councillor Russell. Council Councillor Russell. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. 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 Okay. Um, all right. Councilor Mason, is this uh, you that are going to take us away on this? Yes, please. I move that Halifax Regional Council approve the request to include 6215 Coburg Road, Halifax, as shown in Map 1 of the staff report dated October 20th, 2020, in the Registry of Heritage Property for Halifax Regional Municipality as Municipal Heritage Property. I so move. I'll second, I'll second that. that. Second by Councillor Cuddle. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mason, anything on it? Well, I'd like to thank the Smiths for bringing this to Council and supporting heritage in the neighbourhood. I'd like to welcome them to the neighbourhood as I live two blocks away. Uh, last time I was in that house, I think it was the previous owner had, uh, previous, previous owner were just about to put it on the market about 25 years ago. Uh, and those of us in the neighbourhood have certainly been concerned when it, when it went up for sale that uh, it may get redeveloped rather than saved. So this is delightful and I'm certainly, uh, I'm certainly confident your neighbours are going to be very happy uh, that this is going ahead. And uh, when COVID's over, I look forward to 
walking by and uh, saying hello and uh, talking about heritage as I my I own a house uh, that was built in 1904. So not quite as good, but still also uh, I, I know the trials and tribulations you're going through. So thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I'd like to see you then. Thank you uh, very much. If there's no other questions. Question on the motion. We'll go to the vote. Beginning with District 9, Councillor Cleary. Yes. 10, Councillor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. In favor of the motion. District 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Outhead. Voting yes. One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Absolutely affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. In favor of the motion. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. And Mayor Savage. For the motion, so that motion passes. Uh, Daniel, thank you uh, very much, not only for being here today, but for what you're doing and uh, consider yourself warned that Councillor Mason lives in your neighborhood. There goes the property value. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, colleagues, we will, uh, sorry, Councillor Smith got missed for the motion apparently. Uh, Ian? Sorry, Councillor Smith. Four, no words. I'm always, I'm used to it. Uh, oh, I, four, okay. Councillor Smith. All right, guys, we are, thank you. That okay. closes the Heritage uh, hearing. We are going to move ahead. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank thank you, you very much. Sorry, it was not me unmuting you there. Sorry, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Have a good day and say thank you to your, uh, say thank you to Matt. Uh, I will. Thank you very much. All right, colleagues, we're going to go to 7.1, which is the planning policy review of the Burnside Comprehensive Development uh, District. And after a couple of stops and starts, Councillor uh, uh, Mason, I will go to you. Uh, I think that's Councillor Mancini. Mason Mancini, Mancini, other uh, answer. Mancini, yeah, you're sitting beside him on my screen here. You look, you look so similar. We do. We, we get mistaken all the time along with Councillor Smith. But anyhow, that's another story. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll put the following motion on the floor and then I'll speak to it. Uh, that the Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrator for, uh, Administrative Officer to, one, initiate a process to consider amendments to the Secondary Municipal Planning Strategy for Dartmouth to ensure the Burnside Comprehensive Development District Policies carry out the goals and directions found in the Regional Municipal Planning Strategy and the integrated mobility plan as described in the staff report dated November 18th, 2020, and two, direct staff to follow the public participation program described in the community engagement section of the staff report dated November 18th, 2020. So moved. I'll second that, Mr. Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Kent, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Councillor uh, Kent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So first of all, colleagues, I want to thank you for allowing me to, to defer this not only once, but twice. Uh, and the reason for those deferrals was really there's a bit of a communication gap between the staff, the applicant, and the council of the area. We just simply needed to have some more time to get on, get on the right page. So the applicant has simply asked that we consider changing the uh, boundaries to allow residential development uh, near the Frenchman Lake area. Uh, the area, Dartmouth in general, but that particular area is also identified uh, as a growth area in which is suitable for uh, residential use. So throughout this, see, the staff did have some concerns. Uh, they had concerns about uh, the need for mixed development, not just residential in this area. Uh, the concerns about, you know, rezoning and a development agreement takes a lot of energy, a lot of resources, a lot of time. And that the current policy doesn't really uh, enable light industrial and, and residential use together uh, where it is in the, the Burnside area. But the biggest concern that staff had, and I had also, is it's not a, no, no surprise here, it's not a pedestrian friendly area, right? And uh, 
I think if we were to create that today, we would create it much differently. So now the desire is to make it more of a community. If we're going to add residential, more of a, a pedestrian friendly area, uh, enhance the ability to put in, uh, you know, good, strong uh, tra transportation corridors in there. So what I'm asking colleagues today is um, I've worked with staff uh, and we've worked with the applicant to come up with an alternative motion. So I'm asking that we vote down the motion that I just read to put on the floor and then present uh, a new motion. Uh, I've shared that motion with everybody in the clerk's office and Ian, if you wouldn't mind, Mr. Clerk, putting that into the chat group. Uh, but that's my request today. Staff are, uh, are here uh, on deck as they always are, if you have any questions that pertaining to this, but uh, we worked very closely with staff and the applicant. So, Mr. Mayor, that's my request to uh, uh, vote down the motions on the floor and, and put in the put forward the alternative motion. Okay, that's well laid out. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. I don't see any other speakers, so Councillor Mancini is asking that this motion be defeated and he'll come back with uh, an alternate that we will put in the chat so that you know what it is. Is there any questions? Are we ready for the for the vote on this one? So this is the vote on the motion that Councillor Mancini is asking to be um, uh, defeated. Is everybody clear as to the? OK. All right, Ian, let's uh, do the vote. To the motion on the floor, beginning with District 10, Councillor Morse. Sorry, I say nay if I want to vote defeat the motion. Is that right? Yes. OK, nay. Thank you. 11, Councillor Cuddle. Against the motion. 12, Councillor Stoddard. Against the motion, thank you. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting no. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting against the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. Against the motion. 16, Deputy Mayor Outhead. Voting no. 1, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting against the motion. District 2, Councillor Hensby. A negatory. 3, Councillor Kent. Voting nay. 4, Councillor Purdy. Voting against the motion. 5, Councillor Austin. Against. 6, Councillor Mancini. Against the motion. 7, Councillor Mason. Against the motion. District 8, Councillor Smith. Against. 9, Councillor Cleary. Uh, nay. Mayor Savage. Nay against the motion. So that motion is um, defeated. And uh, Councillor Mancini. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to put the following motion on the floor uh, that the Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to initiate a process to consider amendments to the secondary municipal planning strategy for Dartmouth to update policy for lands near Frenchman Lake, south of Commodore Drive, to enable a transit-oriented, a suburban mixed-use community guided by the goals and directions found in the regional plan, the integrated mobility plan, and the green network plan, with a focus on mixed-use communities, urban design for walkability, community connections and facilities, and environmental protection. So moved. I second that, Mr. Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Kent. Councillor Mancini, anything else on it? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Kent. Um, yeah, very quickly, Mr. Mayor. First of all, I, I didn't uh, do it before. I want to acknowledge the work from staff on this. Uh, they were very agreeable in working and getting everybody on the same page. So I truly appreciate that. So as you can see, uh, the way the motion is, uh, is written, it's really talking about that complete community we're looking to create and huge opportunity for that growth in Dartmouth. And I would appreciate your support. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor. I see no other questions. Ready for the question, Ian? Oh, oh, sorry. I think uh, Councillor Cuddle has a question. Councillor Cuddle? Um, I did have a question. Thank you. Um, you know, I think it is really interesting that, you know, we're looking at putting residential development in a industrial park. And, you know, I've been following what other cities are doing across North America, including cities in Canada like uh, Vancouver, um, other good examples are uh, Portland and Baltimore, where the the city these cities are creating um, kind of a new zoning type 
that enables um, live work communities based on light industrial um, uses and not just kind of looking at putting residential into an industrial park, but putting in residential that encourages um, more live work opportunities. And I'm wondering if that kind of use would be included in this plan. Who do we have that can answer that? I think it's me because I think Sean is having trouble unless Sean is there. Oh, you're Sean. there, great. <laughs> Sean, do you want that? I missed the entire question, so I will have to kick it back to Kate, unfortunately, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so apologies. Uh, Kate Green, uh, Regional Policy Program Manager. So the quick answer is yes. Uh, certainly we can consider that as part of this uh, master planning process for Frenchman's Lake. And that's also something that we'll be thinking about under the regional plan review more broadly for the entire municipality and how we approach that. Okay, that's great. Because when I look at the, the um, elevations of the drawings of all the apartment buildings, I get, I, that doesn't come through that that is an aspect of this. So I get it, we're still, I'm just wondering at what process, you know, what, what stage in the process are we at where we might be able to consider those types of uses? I think um, I see Miles Agar is also here and wants to clarify something first. Maybe I'll go to him on that and then pick up any other comments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Miles Agar here with Regional Planning. Just a point on the proposed motion. So the proposed motion provides the action. Uh, the other uh, thing that council will need to do is approve a public participation program that goes along with that. Um, so you'll see in the original recommendation from staff, there were two recommendations, the second of which was to approve a public participation program as outlined in the report. Uh, so I would recommend uh, uh, if council chooses, they could table that um, as an addition to this proposed motion. And just to clarify what that would be in light of COVID, it's, it's laid out in the report, but it would be a questionnaire or survey sent to stakeholders and nearby property owners early in the process. And then we would uh, engage with the community uh, through typical channels such as uh, phone, email, and so on. Councilor Mancini, you're okay with that? I'm fine with that. Uh, I consider that friendly. Uh, uh, that makes uh, perfect sense. Thank you. Councillor Kent, you're good with that as the seconder? <clears throat> yes. <laughs> All right. Yes. So this will be what was read into the record as this motion, but also number two, uh, which was on the original motion, will be maintained. Councillor Cuddle had asked a question. I'm not sure if planners uh, had got that question and anybody had a had a comment on that uh, through you Mr. Mayor Sean Gillis uh, planning and good. development hopefully my neck my connection stays good uh, just some clear uh, some clarity on uh, Councillor Cuddle's question if you don't mind what I think the councillor is asking is how does this motion on the floor uh, from Councillor Mancini impact uh, developments that have been approved or may come about through the BCD policy. Have I got that correct, Councillor Cuddle? You are mute, uh, Patty. Uh, go Mr. ahead, Mayor. Councillor. Um, yeah, it is. I mean, what further opportunities are there at this point to explore different types of zoning? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, if I could ask the clerk's office to bring up uh, map to zoning. Uh, this was uh, an attachment to the report, and I think if we bring it up on the screen, that will help me to to walk councillors through the different zoning and the what's involved here. Okay, so is this coming up for everyone? It's coming up. It's a little a little hard to. Uh, it looks kind of like a quadruple bypass from this distance. It's getting better. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, again. So the hatch marks, the small dots are the Frenchman Lake property. So the ask from the applicant and what is on the table right now is to 
do a master plan uh, policy exercise to allow mixed use development on that property. Now, the original report, what we dealt with was a question, should we take that property at Frenchman Lake and put the BCDD, the Burnside Comprehensive Development District um, designation on that land? Now you can see on the map, there is a small little area zoned BCDD, and that is an area that currently has the development agreement on it for the buildings I believe you're talking about, the elevations with the uh, mid-rise and the, the high-rise buildings. So that development agreement is already happening and the my understanding is the plan is to get constructing soon. So any amendments wouldn't deal with that property or that agreement. Any policy amendments, excuse me. Below that, there is a right above Commodore, there is another piece of land that isn't currently zoned BCDD. So the Burnside Comprehensive District policy and zone would apply to future applications on that land bordered roughly by Commodore and Finley backing onto the I-2 zone. And I understand that might be a little bit, there's a lot of different designations there, but hopefully that uh, clarifies a little bit for councillors uh, what the current policy does and does not do. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Are you OK with that? Anything else? Yeah, I'm OK. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank, thank you, you, staff. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sure. All right. Um, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just uh, very quickly, I support what uh, Councillor Mancini is trying to do here in terms of um, taking a little bit of a bigger picture at residential in Dartmouth Crossing. Um, there's not many things I can think of um, when I think back on the last uh, four years in which, I'm, which I look at, I was like, man, I really regret my vote. It's a, it's a short list, but on that list is actually the approval of the apartment buildings um, that are currently exist. I think uh, we would have been better placed at Harbor East. I mean, we had a positive staff recommendation. Um, the policy supported uh, doing residential, but um, to build two apartment towers out there in Dartmouth Crossing with no community around them, uh, you know, I, th I think we should have done this at the time um, and taken a bigger look at residential in, in the wider area because if it's going to be there, it'll be more effective if we're building a community out there um, with the supporting infrastructure, then if we're just kind of scattering uh, apartment towers randomly in, a, in an industrial sort of setting uh, without any of the supporting stuff that makes community. So um, thank you, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. All right, uh, Counts uh, Councillor Morse. Yes, uh, does community facilities include schools? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, from a policy perspective, yeah, we'd be looking at, we, we can't make the province build us schools, but some opportunities could be to reserve space or something like that. That could be one possibility. Okay, and do we do we ask the province how they feel about funding in schools in certain areas, or um, is that not part of the process? Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I'm not sure we'd be able to get into that level of detail. I mean, 2,500 units is, is, is one of the ballparks that we've been using for this whole area. It's, it's a big number, but it's not enormous. And I see Kelly coming on, so I will defer to my boss. Thank you. Kelly Denton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just wanted to add in that uh, you know, schools are a provincial matter. There's, there's, you know, as, and as I know, everybody on the call appreciates. And yes, we would look for complete community facilities in inside of the, the planning for this, but, you know, couldn't certainly make any guarantees or promises relative to school siting here. Obviously, we work as closely as we can with the provincial government to, to achieve that. So didn't want, didn't feel it fair for Sean to, to have to answer that question. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Colleagues, are we ready for the question? And it should be known that the French school is across the street from this site. Already existing. Okay. 
Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. Question. Beginning with District 11, Councillor Tuttle. For the motion? 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion? 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. In favor of the motion. District 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Outhit. Yes. District 1, Councillor Dago Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. 2, Councillor Ken. Uh, 2, Councillor Hensby. I'm firm enough. District 3, Councillor Kent. In favor. 4, Councillor Purdy. In favor of the motion. 5, Councillor Austin. In favor. 6, Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. 7, Councillor Mason. For the motion. District 8, Councillor Smith. 4. 9, Councillor Cleary. Yes. 10, Councillor Morse. For the motion. And Mayor Savage. For the motion, so that motion passes. Thank you, colleagues. Councillor Mancini, a final word? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I just want to clarify something. Uh, when we started the discussion on this item, uh, I made a comment earlier on, and it was meant as a joke when I said, uh, Councillor Mason, I get confused for one another all the time, and I included Councillor Smith in that. And I just want to make sure my comments are not uh, misinterpreted. Uh, uh, that uh, does not reflect my uh, values in any way. I have nothing for the utmost respect for Councillor Smith, and if my comments, uh, uh, I apologize if they were hurtful in any way. So I just wanted to make sure uh, that was clear and was not my intent to uh, um, to be disrespectful. Thank you, Councillor Tony. No, no disrespect taken. Thank you, Councillors. OK. Uh, colleagues, we are going to uh, move to uh, item number nine, which is uh, correspondence. Uh, petitions, delegations, correspondence, Madam uh, Mr. Clerk. No additional cor correspondence has been received for items 8.2 and information item three. This correspondence has been distributed to council. Thank you. 9.2 petitions, colleagues. Any petitions? Nine point three. We have no specific presentations other than those that will accompany the uh, agenda items. Um, there will be a couple of uh, items that will have a presentation. We've mentioned Ross Jefferson uh, with the tourism master plan. I believe there's a presentation with the uh, on-demand uh, accessible uh, taxis as well. Information items brought forward none. Reports, uh, item 11.1.1 has passed on consent. That was first reading on streets and proposed uh, administrative order respecting Boulevard Garden. That has passed on consent. 11.1.2 has been removed from the agenda. 11.1.3 navigator program multi-year funding um i have councillor mancini's name on this councillor mancini were you looking to move this or just to speak to this uh, i can speak to uh, i wanted to speak to it i can move it if you wish but uh my uh, i wanted my name on the list just to speak to it if i may if there's anybody who specifically wants to move it that would be fine councillor Tuttle. On mute. Can't, can't hear you, uh, Councilor Pedal. I move that Halifax Regional Council authorize the mayor and municipal clerk to enter into a contribution agreement with the Downtown Halifax Business Commission and Spring Garden Area Business Commission in accordance with attachment nine of the staff report dated January 8th, 2021, to provide a contribution of $45,000 toward the Navigator Street Outreach Program for fiscal 2020-2021, and two, to authorize the Mayor and Municipal Clerk to enter into a one or more 
into one or more contribution agreements with the Downtown Halifax Business Commission, Spring Garden Area Business Commission, Downtown Dartmouth Business Commission, and North End Business Association in accordance with attachment two of the staff report dated January 8th, 2021, to provide a collective annual contribution of 140,000 per year toward the Navigator Street Outreach Program for fiscal 2021, 22, 22, 23, and 23, 24, subject to annual budget approval. Second by Mancini. Seconded by Councillor Mancini. Councillor Cuddle. Um, yeah, I just uh, I just want to speak a little bit about this program um, and and you know why it's coming forward from the bids. Um, you know, part of the business improvement districts. You know, when we when we look at cities kind of across you know across North America, many cities have kind of taken on navigator programs um, to help provide services to homelessness or to those who have who are in vulnerable situations in our, in our cities living on our streets um, putting in things like public bathrooms and providing shelters and um, food programs and, and many many other things um, you know the business associations have played a real leadership role in bringing this type of service to Halifax um, and so well, you know, I think some might say, well, it's a strange, it's a strange fit. In fact, it's been a really good fit in that the business associations, not only are they contributing financially to support these programs, they're also administering and overseeing them. And it's been a really positive partnership between local service providers, the business community and, and the city. Um, and the programs have made a huge impact and if, I'm sure if you've read the report on this, you'll see the number of people that have been reached and the number of services that have been provided. Um, these navigators, you know, the people who have these navigator roles, you know, they often go where the need is, you know, so we're really working very closely with other service providers in our city to help fill gaps or to, you know, meet, meet emerging needs. So I think this program is, you know, for the money is a really good value for us as a city. And it also is a reflection of how we can work collaboratively with our partners um, in helping, you know, um, people in our city and helping our city as a whole. So I, I strongly support this motion. Thank you. Councillor Hensby. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, when this program was first introduced and announced, I was, I was a little hesitant about it because I thought we were getting into the social issues that the province should be more responsible for. And at the time, we had provincial funding as, as, as an assistance to that. And I really hope that provincial funding will still be a part of this program. And hopefully, we don't let them off the hook. And if they are uh, discontinuing their funding, perhaps we should remind them of their social obligation for social services uh, uh, matters. Um, I'm also curious to hear some comments about the emails we received from uh, from our former colleague, uh, Councillor Craig, in regards to now MLA for the Sapor area, about the suburban and rural needs for navigator programs. You know, it seems like this is one of those, uh, it's been a, a focused on where the area is probably the greatest need, but there's also other needs elsewhere. I'd like to know has this topic been discussed with any of the other bids we have outside the greater metro downtown area? Because I know that I've seen more of it happening occurring in the Dartmouth area and uh, and, and, and also uh, on Main Street, I should say, not just downtown Dartmouth, Main Street area where we don't have a bid established yet, I don't believe. The Village on Main we have, but um, I'm not sure about the Sackville regions or, or further out. So I was kind of curious of what comments, has there been any discussion with the other bids about uh, an expansion of the navigator program. Okay, I think we have Scott uh, Sheffield or Paul Johnson. Who do we have with us? <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, it's uh, Scott Sheffield with Government Relations and External Affairs. Go ahead, sir. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor. Um, yes, there has been discussions with the business improvement districts about uh, other districts getting involved in it uh, up to this point in time. 
there hasn't been an expression of interest from the other business districts to be involved with uh, the navigator program from the point of view of delivering a navigator program. Um, certainly, uh, in terms of the evolution of the program, the North End and the downtown Dartmouth saw a need for it, and that's why we now have two navigators and four business improvement districts involved with it. So I think there's been kind of a natural evolution of where there's been a, a need seen in the district that they have stepped up to do it. I will also say that historically the navigators have operated outside of the, the strict confines of where the navigator program boundaries would be from a bid district standpoint. So, you know, if there is somebody outside of the area that needs support, that the navigators have traveled to those areas to offer support. Um, so that that I would say is kind of where where that has uh, ended up in terms of the involvement of the other business districts. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor Hensby, for uh, uh, raising this uh, concern. This is what uh, I was thinking too when I was reading the report that there's no mention of the uh, the rural pilot report that was passed a couple of years ago. So, I, if I understand what you're saying, uh, Scott, it's um, you're basically saying that uh, this has gone, this hasn't progressed because there hasn't been uh, um, work or there, the uh, the other uh, business improvement districts are not uh, um, coming on board at this point. Is that, is, am I hearing you correctly? Yes, and then in terms of seeing a need within their particular district and being in a, in a position where their board would support it, um, the other districts have not uh, either expressed an interest in, in taking on that rule and have not expressed that uh, the homelessness issue was something that was uh, highly visible within their area. <clears throat> and in terms of okay. the rural and suburban, um, from the point of view of, of uh, the navigator rule, navigator rule typically will deal with the on-street population and uh, in, in terms of rural and suburban homelessness, it tends not to be on street population. There tends to be more of a hidden homelessness and couch surfing um, mm -hmm. uh, that, that happens. Uh, so the same sort of resource doesn't kind of work in the same way in that type of community. Okay, um, thank you for that. I will, uh, I'll uh, pass this, sir. I will, uh, defer the rest of my time because I see that uh, Councillor Russell wants to speak and I know that this is uh, something that he has been very, very active in uh, working with or working on the last few years. So uh, I thank you very much for that. Thank you, Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a good program. Uh, there is no question about that. We have had the urban navigator uh, out here in suburban, uh, Sackville uh, a number of times and, and trying to help us out. Some of the survey that was conducted was out here in Sackville. Um, Scott, you made mention of the on-street population. Uh, Councillor Cuddle, uh, you made mention of the population living on our streets. The difference between uh, the urban population and the suburban or rural population is they don't live on our streets. They live in the woods. Mm -hmm. um, we are immediately adjacent to the Nova Scotia forest, what, or, or what's left of it. Um, and we have people who are in pockets all around the place. Uh, we don't know how many, it is very difficult to find. So when the navigator came out here to conduct uh, the survey and when other people have come out here to, to conduct a survey of where exactly the homeless population is, how big is it, how much of a problem is it? We don't know. Um, we've, we have not been able to use the same strategy to uh, identify the population as has been used downtown. Uh, we can't see them. You, uh, Scott, you made mention that they're less visible. They absolutely are. Uh, they have their, their shelters, their tarps, their whatever structures they have in the woods, and we don't know where they are. That does not mean that we don't have a need. We have the uh, Freedom Kitchen, which has been serving free meals every Monday. At this point, it's about 400 free meals every week uh, to people who need it. And, and they are a great help in being able to um, identify people and draw them out of the woods 
uh, and, and say here is something for nothing. You don't have to uh, have any qualifier other than you have to be there. And if you aren't there, then a meal is delivered to you. So we do have a need for it out here in the urban, uh, sorry, in the suburban and rural areas. We just don't know how big it is. Um, I would like to see this expanded and, and I will absolutely work with a bit. I've got a, a few questions about it. Uh, one of them is in reference to the $140,000 uh, contribution that we're looking at from HRM. This had been $45,000 and the bids had been contributing. So since this is going up to $140,000, what are we asking the bids to contribute? Um, has has that gone negative? Has it? Uh, I, I see in um, the in attachment three, the funding breakdown. There was one hundred and twenty thousand dollars contributed by HRM in twenty twenty one. If we're asking for one hundred and forty, does that mean that the bids and other people have to contribute twenty thousand dollars? No, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. No, that's that's not the case. What what we're looking for here is additional uh, money to be able to use to support people who are precariously housed or at risk of losing their their housing uh, because of the increased uh, frequency with which people are facing that situation. Uh, partly because of the whole uh, scenario in terms of low vacant vacancy rates but also because of the impacts of COVID. So the dual kind of uh, scenario happening within the context of HRM has increased the number of people who are at risk. So the increase in, in money is intended to give them the ability to support people who are uh, at, at risk of eviction. So, um, and I don't know whether you want to comment, uh, uh, Councillor Cuddle, but uh, the HRM did make some additional money available uh, recently to, to, to meet that need, but that's where they were seen to be uh, a need for additional funding for that purpose. Uh, so that's that's kind of where, where it's coming from. Okay, so this is in relation to people who are precariously housed and at risk. It's not for people who are homeless. The, the scope is broadening a little bit. Does that overlap with anything that community services is providing or other agencies are providing, or is this a unique service? It's a unique service uh, in the sense that, that the populations aren't necessarily the same. Um, and oftentimes you have people who are in an immediate need that don't have the ability to access uh, other supports um, or are ineligible for the support. So it, it, and in some cases it might be an overlap, but some t in some cases it may be the fact that they need it very immediately or they're going to be evicted. And if they don't get it immediately, then they're in a situation which makes it much more difficult to house them. So when you have people with their, that the navigator is trying to move off the street into to housing, once they've done that, um, to get them back into new housing is much more difficult than to keep them in that housing. Right. Uh, so that's 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 the kind of imperative for it. So you have people that that they've been able to house, but you don't want a situation where they're then forced out of that housing. No, and that's and that's understandable. Uh, Mayor, I, I don't know uh, how much time I've got left. You've got time for a quick comment. Does it have to be a bid? Does, or can it be some other community group uh, that is spearheading this? Um, and if I, if I have to come back for an answer to that, then I absolutely will. I think we can get an answer to that part. Does it have to be a bid, Scott? Through me, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, I guess the quick answer would be no. Uh, that's not an imperative. That's been the model that we've had up to this point. Uh, but there's nothing to say that it couldn't be another entity that, that had that role. OK, thank you. Thank, you, thank you very much for now. If there's more, I'll come back. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, really quickly, I think the uh, councillor Russell, the question that that you asked wasn't answered because uh, I, I were you were you asking if we were HRM contributing 140 to it or was that the collective? That is the motion that HRM would be contributing 140 thousand dollars. Right. So so the read it up the way that I read the motion, I was going to get clarification on this too. The read the way that I read it is HRM would count contribute forty-five thousand and then as a collective with the bids, 
140,000 would be so that's not the case. Uh, three of you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. No, that's the, the case is that we would be contributing 140 uh, between the two business improvement districts so to cover off both of the two navigators that are currently in place. Right. So, so when it says to provide a collective annual contribution, who, who is the collective? Between the North End, the downtown Halifax, the downtown Dartmouth, and Spring Garden. Uh, so, that just is wording that it would allow us to send the money to one entity and them to apportion it out uh, as agreed between the bids or to do multiple agreements. So uh, okay. the intent was more so to capture the fact that that we didn't want to lock ourselves into some uh, wording for the the respective agreement. Right. The just yeah the way that it, it's worded, it seems like that 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 to provide a collective annual contribution of that all of the bids that are mentioned would would provide that collective annual contribution. So, which is that it was confusing to me and Councillor Councillor Russell kind of started that, but that was one piece and in, in uh, it's it, it, yeah, it, anyway, I'm not going to focus on that. What I will focus on is that uh, support this. I, I did have a question around the the added contribution, understanding the the it's around ninety thousand dollars that 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 is is for the current structure and obviously as you mentioned scott the the extra contribution would be for the other issues as i read in the report uh through you mr mayor to the councillor uh, up to this point it's been 60 and 45 which would be 105 collectively so we're looking at a incremental of 35,000. okay so i'm so i was looking at just the downtown dartmouth actually so on the page there's no number here on the report, uh, page 22, there's no page number, but page 22 uh, in the PDF, it has a total of 90,000 with the breakdowns of the expenses and, and the revenue. Do you see that table there? Um, yes. Attachment three, is that what you're referring to? Uh, do attachment. Yes. No, it's attachment seven. No. Attachment seven. And it has the table of. Of expenses and then on the bottom of it, it has the budget revenue expenses and then it has 90,000 on the bottom of that. Right, that would be for one of the two bids. OK, so that's just for just for one of the two. So that would be 90 times two. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, each individual bid has different um, budgets, uh, so they're slightly different. And there, there has been historically a, a differential between the two bids: um, the downtown Dartmouth and and North End business districts. Uh, right. We're not right. in a financial position to contribute as significantly as downtown Halifax and Spring Garden bids for the project. So there was a difference between the two bids historically. Right, and, and so I, it may be um, um, just my, my brain is foggy today, but that table on the bottom, it doesn't it doesn't say that this is just one bid uh, finances. I see that it has North End. Yeah, there's, it doesn't point to what the financing is. So that's why I'm just trying to get an understanding of, of if what this 90,000 is so I can clarify. And I think Patty or Councillor Cuddle, maybe you can clarify for me what this table here actually is for. Clarify that actually. <laughs> um, so that so there's two navigator programs, right? right? So this Halifax one, and Dartmouth. How, well, there's North End, if you look at the, the logos on the top here, we've got North End Business Association and yeah. Downtown Dartmouth. Yeah. So North End and Downtown Dartmouth have joined together to run yeah. one program. So that 90,000 is for that one program. Right. Right. And then the other program is, so the money, even though it's Neva administers the finances for the joint program. So that's for North End and Dartmouth. Then the other funding would be for Spring Garden Road and downtown Halifax. Okay, cool. And I. 
So I think I think I'm I'm with you now. Uh, so the, my my question was answered earlier. Just I just want a clarification on on the table. And the last piece I'll I'll leave I'll leave here. Um, you know the work that the navigators do uh, is is next to, to none. They they do amazing work and and you know you deal with that that urgent need that some of our services can't can't provide because of how urgent it is and. And I could I could name many examples where you know I I send a text to one of the navigators and they're on it right away and within a couple hours that person has gotten the support that they need whether it was rent or need a place to stay that night or et cetera so you know that's important and also to highlight some of the comments around you know this not needing shouldn't just be focused in in the the core if you look at the partners the partners that are connected to the navigator program most of them are located in the areas that are of most need and these navigators rely on those partners as well because there's, there's only a few of them and they need the support from those partnerships and and you know unless we start to see more organizations form outside of the core um, it'd be difficult for these these navigators to be successful in other areas just because those supports are just as important as the navigators themselves so you know hopefully the bids that are outside would be interested and also there would be more supports made in the areas that need it because of, as mentioned these are these are folks who are dealing with on the street uh and you know they they need supports right away so i, I support this and and got a better understanding of where the finances is so thanks for that okay thank you because we forgot you on a vote earlier i gave you an extra two minutes and nine seconds councillor smith uh, but that doesn't go for everybody uh, <laughs> appreciate it <laughs> Councillor Mancini taking the time to sign up early. I forgot to put him on the list. So, Councillor Mancini, you're next. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you know, um, this is extremely important program, and we've heard from my colleagues that looking for an expansion of this program. And so, Scott, right now, if you could answer this question, the the, the bids are uh, managed the program. It's their their the street navigators belong to them. We just help fund it. Are they restricted from a geographical area in the two navigator programs? Do they have a boundary or how far they can go? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, uh, technically, no. Um, practically, there's some degree of truth in that. Um, there, there are only two people and they can only do so much. Uh, but, you know, as Councillor Russell has pointed out, the navigator has been sacral. Um, so they will go places other than the urban core as needed and when possible. Um, so they have a significant caseload, even with the two of them. You know, so having doubled the number of navigators in the European core, they still do a lot of work with uh, a lot of people. Um, so that limits their capacity to uh, yeah. the core, but, but there's nothing preventing them from doing that. Yeah, thank you, Scott. You know, uh, colleagues, uh, it's quite evident that this program needs to be expanded. But how do we, how do we expand this program? I really think the opportunity for us, colleagues, is to work with the libraries. The library and central library has a social worker, which is really a street navigator. And that that social worker, uh, she is uh, full. I mean, her workload is full and it just goes to the point of we need to expand this. Right. Uh, so you look at where our libraries are located and, and uh, Council Russell, you you know, you, you have a strong relationship with the library in your areas. We all do with our libraries. I think there's the opportunity. And I think offline, Mr. Mayor, we should be maybe a few of us getting together with the navigator program with the libraries and look at this i know the libraries are looking at possibly expanding that social working program and i think there's a role for us to play as a municipality and help support it uh, financially on this you know you defund the police conversation has come up over and over again and what elements of that uh, you know does a street navigator play a huge element so i think this is extremely important i support the motions on the floor and i think we should just obviously pass it today but there's some work that needs to be done and I'm prepared to work with whomever and work uh, and have some conversations with the library as an example and other partners uh, as the Councillor Smith alluded to. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Diggle Gammon. You're on mute. Uh. You're on mute, Kathy. Oh, I'm having a little bit of trouble with the mute button today. Um, my husband would like that if it could, he could figure that out. Um, so I also support the motion. 
I'm curious a little bit about in, in the report where it talks about um, that the navigators go to areas where there is density um, and so how, how they might use that, but some of that has been answered. And I also agree with Councillor Russell and he asked some of my questions in that um, the what doesn't fit in the urban and where people are that need this kind of support. They're, they're in the woods, but they're also in abandoned properties. And uh, we see that a lot in the rural area of HRM, that abandoned properties get to be homesteaded a little bit or whatever you want to, how, whatever word you want to use. But so the system to find those people and to be supportive of those people needs to be a little bit different. In the conversation that was held saying that there was a rural pilot, I think if, uh, is it possible for us to read that report? what happened in the rural pilot so that that could inform how we would maybe find what is the appropriate partner that we need so that we can help uh, those persons that, God love them, two navigators doing all of that work is a lot. So how do we uh, get to augment that so that we cover all of HRM and see what can, what can be done? And I think that rural pilot could inform that conversation very well and I would love to work on that. So if there is a, a rural pilot report, great. Can we read it? Scott? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Uh, we had uh, Affordable Housing Nova Scotia working on that. They have given us a uh, feedback report, um, which we could share with council. The, uh, the feedback in that report uh, was, I think, in some respects, compromised by COVID and the ability to gather information was challenging because of the, the COVID scenario. Um, that having been said, uh, there was not a recommendation made by Affordable Housing Nova Scotia for rural nav navigators. That really was not necessarily the, um, the purpose of that initial report. The idea was to strengthen the coordinated access system in regards to rural and suburban um, communities, but um, it certainly is something that could be revisited. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, uh, Scott. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks colleagues for all your questions. A lot of my um, points have been uh, covered, but I'm going to reiterate a number of them. Uh, I certainly am supportive of, of a motion such as this. I'm so completely supportive of a navigator role. I think there, there are so many um, layers of some form of a navigator, whether it's at a church, whether it's at a, a local service club, whether it's at a, a community kitchen table. Our, our communities are all trying to find ways to connect the dots for people who are in distress and people who are in need. So anything we can do to support that. I think that as well, the, the notion that uh, municipalities no longer have a role in social issues is long past. We, we have to look at, at the situations differently. We've already tipped our, uh, dipped our toe into the, many of those realms. So this to me is a no brainer for the municipality. I do have some questions around budgets, but I'll just finish my points. Um, the rural areas uh, of, of many districts have absolutely needs to have some uh, consideration here. And the fact that you are not fixed or that so far the, the program or the support is not fixed to BIDs is, is a must um, because many places in the rural areas don't have those. Uh, um, and, but we can't, we can't uh, sit back and wait. Um, some of our council members have mentioned that we'd like a copy of the report. We'd like a discussion. I think we need all of that. We, we, I'm happy to support this, assuming that um, I have my budget questions answered. And, but, but I want to go so far as to say, I'm asking you now to leave this meeting and, and commit to uh, working with some councillors who have something to offer on the issue of, of, of creating some momentum in our rural areas around the navigator, navigator position. Um, we have connections. We also have the, 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 we hear a lot on the many, many versions of people in uh, homeless situations or struggling with mental health and addictions, perhaps fleeing domestic violence. There's a number of layers and it, it, it is daunting for uh, any community group 
including a church, including a service club to think, uh, well, we could take we we have the capacity, we have the in-house, we have the in-house expertise and, and, and the longevity of our organization to manage something like this, but they don't necessarily know who to reach out to, how to how to connect to a, a, an initiative such as this within our our uh, at the municipality. Um, so I would like to uh, absolutely be part of uh, a, a discussion. I think the quicker the better. These things don't happen overnight. Um, and so I'll be looking for anything you bring to the table. I think that we really can sink our teeth in to give some input and maybe create some next steps to move that second layer. I'm not comfortable with accepting that the um, urban areas are the only areas that should be serving our our older regions. They we have this um, a, a mentality for sure, whether we like it or not, that our our urban centers are are receiving a lot of these services and our older center older areas are not. And it's 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 a it's a case of not necessarily being aware that there is someone within the urban area that would actually come out to the community. And if they come out, would they really know what their what their this community might be experiencing? So there's a little there's a divide, and I think councillors can play some connectivity on that. Uh, from a, a library's perspective too, I love that idea from Councillor Mancini. But not all areas have libraries or have access to some of those. So again, we're facing that, and I think that's what some of the councillors can have, offer insight to. What I'm wondering though um, on the budget allocation, of course, it says through uh, if there's a budget approval, where does this sit? I, uh, I'll just reiterate, I'm not a fan of continuing to add and add and add to the parking lot that we have to then negotiate and find a way to support uh, later um, to to get some of these through and then have to increase taxes and such. I'm not a fan of that this year. So I want to know ahead of time that a, a motion like this, where does that sit? Is that potentially already captured in some form of a budget that has been presented to us already that has has already pro offered their their overs and unders um, or is this another new layer that we have to to look at uh, when we look at this five year budget? Thank you. Scott. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, I'll defer to Paul on that. Paul Johnston. Well, I see the CAOs jumped in too. Did the CAO I, want to jump in on this or? Oh, <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> I think this program is an exceptional program and I appreciate the desire to expand the program. If that is the case and council decides that it wants to look at that question, then the notice of motion would be required and uh, framed up appropriately so that we're not, we, we are actually addressing specifically what council as a whole wants to do on this matter. So we're more than prepared to you know, work with you and work with any councillor to frame up a notice of motion if that's that's the intent and uh, you know because obviously you know, anything like this any expansion of the program would require a staff report would require you know consultation uh, and all that so this is more than just sort of getting together as a small group and having a conversation this is a much larger uh, request that I would all due respect so Mr. Mayor that's what I would I would offer is that I'm certainly happy Paul and his team and Scott would be more than me more than willing to help frame up and notice a motion if that's what the councillor's desire is and uh, go right. there. Thank you. In terms of the, the question was uh, this particular money, I think the question was where is this in the budget process? Uh, Paul, maybe that's something that you can, you're aware? Yep, most definitely I'm working here on the call. Um, it's Paul Johnston, Managing Director of Government Relations and External Affairs uh, and through the Mayor to the Councillor. Short answer is yes, it was included in the base budget that was presented uh, when the CAO brought forward his budget a couple of weeks ago. So this is not uh, this is not new money. This is money that's already in the existing budget. Okay, thank you, uh, Jacques, and thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, Councillor Kent, if you have anything else, I'll have to come back to you. We're at seven minutes uh, right now. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So. I guess I feel like uh, we got a bit of a square peg round hole thing, which is that everybody likes the programming offered through the idea of the navigator, uh, but the nav HRM doesn't have a navigator. HRM funds downtown Halifax Spring Gardens Navigator and North End Halifax 
and Dartmouth Navigator. And that's an important distinction. And we've been here before when the program first was talking about expanding into the North End, which is in the summer, they might have two or 300 people a week that they're keeping track of just in the downtown core, just in that one kilometer area. And that one person, whoever it may be, is flat out busy. So, so we got to a place where, you know, you, we, we have to recognize the downtown and Spring Garden businesses are putting in tens of thousands of dollars, providing office space, providing phones, providing all of the administrative support because we don't employ these people. Uh, that being said, so, so I'm going to push back on that because I know Paul and probably Sue are watching going, please don't make us run the program for all of HRM out of our offices in downtown Halifax, right? That being said, uh, you know, I agree with what I've heard from Councillor Mancini and, and some of the other councillors that this is a much larger issue. I think, you know, what we're talking about is a, you know, in my opinion, I'll just say straightforwardly, a, a failure of community services to adequately provide on the street support for people who are most in need. That's what we're talking about. And that uh, expresses itself in a bunch of different ways in a bunch of different communities. Uh, HRM used to be more involved with the delivery of social work and, and community services. Perhaps that is the motion that needs to be made. Perhaps the motion is to talk about, are we gonna provide more resources to uh, community developers or to in rec or to the library to provide more uh, services, uh, these, these, this kind of service. Uh, certainly watching how hard the navigators worked the eight years uh, that I've been here and the three different navigators we've had in the downtown Spring Garden area, uh, they don't have the kind of job security that a government employee does and they don't have the kind of health plan that a government employee does and they don't have the kind of pension plan that a government employee does and they're working really hard, really hard Right. And and so I have wondered whether or not this should become a thing that we are talking about as a municipality, which is going to cost more money and be much larger than what we're talking about here. Uh, and I'm not against having that discussion. I think we should. I think we need to have equivalent support. But I just I just wanted to caution everybody that this is not an HRM program. This is a downtown and Spring Garden and North End and Dartmouth uh, program. And they put in significant resources of their own. And uh, and I'm all for expanding it, but but we it, I don't think it can expand on the current model. I think it has to be changed to reflect the fact that it would become something kind of fundamentally different than it is now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. I think that ties into what Jacques was saying in terms of the work that needs to be done on this for sure. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I was going to make the point that Councillor Mason just made, so now I don't have to. But just to <sighs> When we look at this program, so it's a street navigator program. So when you're dealing with suburban and rural homelessness, as counselors from those areas have already said, it's a different kind of homelessness. People are in the woods, People, it's a hidden phenomenon. People are couch surfing, they're living in cars. A street navigator hanging out on a main street in a suburban area is not going to see those things and those people are not going to see that person in order to get access to the supports that they can provide. So we're talking about fundamentally different programs. As Councilor Mason said, it's not our program. We're just passing some money along uh, to folks who are running the program. Um, it, you know, the expression, it takes a village. So this isn't just HRM's responsibility. This is primarily a provincial responsibility, but Think about all of the churches, non-governmental organizations, the, the 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 city, the bids, all the folks who are, are involved in helping out those who are marginalized or who are having a hard time. The street navigator a couple of years ago helped me, came up from Spring Garden Road to Quinpool, actually way down Quinpool to Flynn Park, because we had a few people sleeping rough just beside uh, the park on the CN land. And so they, they do travel when necessary, when requested. Um, unfortunately, they couldn't help those people. They refused to off, take the supports that were offered to them. And so, you know, they're, they're not magical. They can't sort of, they're not unicorns that solve every problem in the municipality. They're doing a particular job. And remember why they're there in the first place and why we help fund them. Business improvement districts are businesses. They're groups of businesses and they're on these main streets. And when you have a lot of street involved people, you, you can't help but look out your store window and say, how, how can we help these folks? And so the bids pulled together and said, look, we, we need a program to, to help these folks who are just hanging out uh, and, and how do we provide some supports for them? They're, the Street Navigator program was born. And so I'm all for us getting involved, but it's not going to be the same program everywhere. It's not even gonna be our program. We should probably more than any other thing we look at and we already do this with lots of groups that come to us for grants. Uh, those who are best placed to offer the supports 
are the ones that we could be helping out so that we're not duplicating a service. We're in fact multiplying what they're already doing. We're leveraging their uh, closeness to the issue and their own expertise in it. So I definitely support this uh, and I definitely support looking at how else we can help but it's not going to be an expansion of this program everywhere in the municipality. That just wouldn't be feasible. But what can the municipality do? And, and I'm open to those discussions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Lovelace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, staff. Really appreciate this program. I absolutely support it. It is fabulous uh, partnership, um, you know, to to ensure that we're there. Uh, supporting these organizations to support the people who are on the ground. And uh, most of my comments have already been said. I agree this is not a rural program. It's this isn't even a stopgap to support, uh, you know, people in need in, in rural programs because the model just doesn't work. Uh, that being said, yes, we have organizations in the rural areas, the Lions Club, uh, the food banks, the churches and so on, who are very supportive, uh, but uh, as uh, the CAO has just pointed out, you know, certainly notice of motion um, is needed for us to get a staff report to review how we can support uh, those who are uh, sleeping rough, uh, homeless in rural areas. So I'll be looking forward to that report. Uh, Scott, that uh, was mentioned earlier, affordable housing Nova Scotia. Um, it, did you have a time that you think that we would be able to have that report back? Is there any kind of um, you know, sense of, of what the deadline could be for that report? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, uh, AHANS has delivered the report to us, so we have it in hand. So we just don't have, it hasn't been circulated? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if I could Sorry, if I could just uh, quickly weigh in on this one. We received the report uh, two days ago, so we we had a follow up meeting with a hands and we'll uh, we'll sort of take it from here and and uh, circulate it once we've had a, a chance to look at it and speak further with them. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. OK, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to follow up on a couple of things. One, I really appreciate CAO's offer to work with with uh, someone and I'd like to be uh, certainly put my name forward or around some form of a notice of motion. I agree that this uh, HRM is not a deliverer of this such service. It is a it is a collaborative effort with other agencies and services. What I want to point out really very clearly is that it would take a, a different type of model, but nonetheless important that we have something for the rural areas that uh, um, that I also on the on the uh, we can we can certainly bring something forward to council in the way of a formal report, but I think that there is a gap of knowledge for many of us who are new councillors and who are in particular have more rural areas that we're representing uh, on on what has taken place, what was in place around that pilot. I think that's still a, a, a presentation that would be helpful to some of us to get a, an understanding of where have we been from the municipality's perspective on, on this issue, and then uh, it would allow us to have a better conversation in council when we bring a, motor, a motion forward. So anything we can do to further that along would be great. And a report is one thing to read, but often we have questions. It's much, it's it, from, a, from a learning perspective for the other councillors, I know I learn well when I'm listening to other people's questions on, on it. So if we could have a, a joint um, uh, update on what, what that pilot looked like, and why it's where it sits, why it's if it's stalled, and what why, then then I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And um, just to a comment from one of the councillors that as as that is uh, drafted for consideration, that could include youth in crisis if that was the will of uh, of councillors. Councillor uh, Cuttle, I think back to you. Back to me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, actually, several of the points I wanted to um, bring up have been brought up. I, you know, I just want to, you know, if you go back to that table that Councillor Smith was looking at with the ninety thousand dollars, you'll note that thirty thousand of that ninety was actually supplied through the business improvement districts, and business improvement districts are funded through levies on commercial properties. So that's actually private sector funding that's coming from mostly from our small businesses. Um, to help support this program. And, you know, when you, well, the program in and of itself might not be directly applicable to other areas of HRM. 
I do think that there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from this program that could be applied. And I, you know, things that spring to mind are, you know, ID clinics, um, bringing, you know, the services of Access Nova Scotia right into communities so people don't have to travel to Bears Lake or wherever they need to travel to to get their ID. And if you don't have ID, then you can't apply for a job or for services or naloxone training. Um, you know, the navigator worked with uh, business owners on the street to administer naloxone because that is where the people were who were in need of that service. You know, this pro, uh, um, another great one was mental health um, wellness clinics, you know, um, helping educate people on the impacts of trauma, mental health and addictions. So, I mean, all of this is great work and I think there's a lot of things that could be a lot of lessons that could be learned and applied in di two different areas. Um, and, you know, you know, just back to where this originated from, like, as I said, there are other cities that are running navigator programs, um, not bids. The, the bids were actually inspired by what other cities were doing. Um, they were municipal programs. Um, I think the one I went to see was in San Francisco. And you know, we learned from those things and came back and saw a need. We saw that there was a gap. And the gap was to what um, Councillor Cleary was saying, was that the municipality and amalgamation kind of washed our hands of providing community services with the province taking over those responsibilities and the province wasn't necessarily adapted working at issues on the streets on city streets and so the bids stepped in and while they contribute private sector money and there's municipal money you know they also apply for grants from from the province um, for, for other initiatives, rely on other services like, you know, the the mental health and well-being clinics and the naloxone training come from programs that already exist in the city. It's just tapping into those resources. And that's what a navigator is also really good at doing. So, you know, I think there's some real value, you know, now that I'm, I'm here representing Spryfield, Zambro Loop and Prospect Road, I too see the need in these communities and the bids aren't always, in, not in every case, are they gonna be the best vehicles for delivering this service, but there are other community partners. Um, but I do know that bids are also, you know, they share, they're highly collaborative. Our the favorite term in bids is um, doing R&D, which is rip off and duplicate that we don't need to keep reinventing the wheel every time. So I'm sure that there would be some support um, for looking at how we can broaden this idea of what a navigator program is. But um, I, you know, I just want to add that context and, and you know, in terms of taking the navigators out of the North End and, uh, or downtown or Dartmouth, um, you know, they are stretched to capacity, but I also think it is really important to keep in mind where a good portion of the funding for that program is coming from, and it's not an HRM program. We need, we need to, look look at either creating our own program or finding how we support other partners. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to say a couple of words on this that everybody else has spoken. Um, and I feel very strongly about this that, you know, Councillor Cuddle had mentioned the leadership the bids have shown and they have. They've been, they have been, as Councillor Cleary spoke about, these are, these are businesses who, who go beyond just their own business in terms of their responsibility. Um, but I would also say so is HRM. In the last number of years, HRM has stretched its mandate considerably in the areas of social uh, justice and responsibility. Um, and, and one thing that occurs to me that might be useful for some of the newer councillors to look at if they get a chance, even though it's a little bit dated, is the second Claremont report uh, on uh, prevention of, uh, of crime and, and uh, speaks a lot about the prevention of crime and uh, as opposed to dealing with crime after it happens. I think that ties into a lot of this stuff. But in the last number of years, um, you know, Councillor Hensby said he wasn't really sure about this when it first came to Council because it's a kind of a community services thing and that's not really our, you know, our bag. But our, our Council over the last number of years has taken enormous steps on being part of a Housing First initiative on, on Gottagen Street. Uh, creating right out of about five feet from here, the mobile food market, the navigator program, whenever it came back for help, um, you know, council has supported that. Um, 
and I think that there's a lot of good things that we have done. This is this is work that we do need to do, and I think we have to take a broader look at at poverty across the board, and we have to understand that you know there are financial implications for that. Uh, and we do need to have serious conversations with the province about whose area this is. But I've always said in the same way that we go to the feds and the province for help on infrastructure, which is our responsibility, we have to step up and say we're prepared to be part of the solution on these things. I spoke with Bill Blair yesterday about uh, some initiatives the feds have and uh, and he was very good. And he said, Mayor, what do you need from the federal government? And I said, one thing we need is to stop giving us great pilot projects and then walking away from them once they work and leaving them to us. Like in Halifax, we had to deal with that under the National Crime Prevention Strategy. Things like ceasefire, we had to deal with it with the Youth Advocate Program. We start these programs with the help of other orders of government and then they say the five years is up and uh, uh, we're going to walk away from it. So I really believe that working together is important, not just so we can announce new programs so that when they work, we can actually uh, continue them and continue to show results. The Navigator program is hugely uh, important and uh, um, the work they do is amazing. So I thank uh, Councillor Cutter for her involvement uh, in that and this. And um, I think that uh, we can be proud as a city that, you know, when we see an issue, we're going to deal with it. We're not just going to point fingers. We're going to actually, instead of pointing fingers at government, we're going to uh, extend a hand to people who need it. So I think that's really important uh, for us. So. I think it was a really good discussion. Colleagues, thank you. Ready for the question? Ian. Beginning in District 12, Councillor Stoddard. Support of the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Odet. Voting yes. One, Councillor Daigle Gannon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. District three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. In very much favor of this. Thank you. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. District nine, Councillor Cleary. Yay. Ten, Councillor Morris. In favor of the motion. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. Enthusiastically in favor of the motion. Thank you. And, and Mayor Savage. For the motion, thank you uh, very much, colleagues. Just looking at our agenda, we have Ross Jefferson coming at 315. It's a presentation as part of 11.2.1, .1, which is our next uh, agenda item. There's a presentation as part of 11.3. Colleagues, I wonder if we might go to 11.5.1 .1 and see if we can do that before we take a break. I don't know if that's uh, got a lot of discussion attached uh, to it. Um, is everybody OK if we do 11.5.1 .1 development of heritage properties? Uh, Councillor Mason, would that be you? If uh, no member of the Heritage Advisory Committee wishes to do it, I'll put it on the floor. Is there a member? It's a good question. Is Patty, mm. Councillor Cuddle. Councillor Cuddle, you want that? Sure. Just clicked off the motion here. All right. Um, eleven five one. Eleven five one. Um, I make the motion that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to identify additional Heritage Conservation District study areas within the South End Secondary Plan area as per Option 3 of the December 22nd, 2020 staff report for potential inclusion in the Regional Centre Secondary Municipal Planning Strategy. Second. Second by Councillor Mason, Councillor Cuddle, anything else? Um, um, well, I'm new to the Heritage Advisory Committee um, and I have heard a little bit um, about, about this from our Heritage Planner, Aaron Murnaham, um, but I'm going to uh, let staff, is there a staff presentation for this? I will let staff present and uh, come back and comment. There's no present, there's no presentation. There's no 
you're relying on me to make the presentation, then that's going to be a <laughs> slim. Um, I don't. Um, I'll, I'll defer to uh, Councillor Mason if he wants to speak to this one. Okay, we'll go to Councillor Cleary first. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Uh, just a quick question for staff. In the report, it does talk about how um, other HCDs, Heritage Conservation Districts, will sort of take precedence in terms of just uh, chronological priority. Where are we right now? Uh, we've got a number of Heritage Conservation Districts proposed. Uh, research is, I think this Old South Suburb uh, was the last one that I saw. Um, so realistically, how long is this going to happen? You mentioned in the report too that uh, just by by kind of zeroing in on this and focusing on it, we in a sense have some protection. So if they could speak to the whatever protection may come from us declaring this and just get a time frame of when we might expect some of the other ones to come forward and when this one would come forward. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, my name is Seamus McGrail, Heritage Planner. With the Heritage Property Program, um, and to answer your question through uh, through Mr. Mayor, um, we do have uh, a confirmation from regional councils or direction from regional council to uh, proceed with uh, four heritage conservation districts ahead of any others. So we'll be doing the downtown Halifax Heritage Conservation District next, so including the capital area of uh, of downtown Halifax, followed by downtown Dartmouth. Uh, followed by the old north suburbs, so the uh, historic spine of Brunswick Street and Creighton's Field. So those will be the four next uh, heritage conservation districts um, in, in order of priority. Um, we anticipate that we, we, we would like to find ways of speeding up the process to do these heritage conservation districts, whether that's with more resources, more staff. So we are looking at options of, uh, of getting these done much, much quicker. And now that we've now that we've completed Schmidtville and, and Old South Suburb, we have uh, templates uh, to work from uh, in, in terms of the community engagement and uh, policy writing. <coughs> so we do anticipate um, to, to find ways of uh, um, getting these done sooner. In terms of the question around um, what what interim measures are in place to protect heritage resources. Uh, with center plan package B, if an area is identified as a future potential heritage conservation district, we, we are introducing a uh, policy in, under center plan package B to e either reduce um, heights or uh, FARs, uh, floor area ratios in, in those areas, so you don't, you, that you don't get um, a lot of uh, potentially inappropriate development in those areas leading up to a heritage conservation district. And then we use the Heritage Conservation District planning process to introduce stronger conservation measures, but also also possibly new new development opportunities as well, like we did with Schmidtville and the Old South, South Suburb, where we actually introduced more development potential because at the same time we introduced uh, stronger conservation measures. Thank you, Mr. McGrail. So in, in essence, the protection comes in um, a lack of up zoning, if you want to call it that, in those potential HCDs, not from just simply declaring something will be future HCD. Uh, uh, thank you for that uh, answer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Well, you took everything I was going to say. I mean, basically, the uh, so good job, Councillor Cleary. And, and and Mr. McGrail, the uh, you know definitely of interest, uh, which initially was resisted by residents on the street, is a potent, but now is something that people are interested in discussing is a uh, possible heritage conservation district on Young Avenue, for example. And there's certainly some other areas around. There are some very strong, uh, you know. Uh, so we're talking about that whole Victoria Road, English Street area. There's uh, uh, South Park uh, to South Street, uh, and there's a number of other smaller uh, uh, streets and neighborhoods that potentially could be considered. So I do support this because it'll inform the center plan, as as Seamus indicated, and allow us to more appropriately zone stuff to make sure that we don't see density uh, being uh, inserted to the detriment of the heritage. So I would ask for council support in this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other speakers ready for the question. Ian. Beginning with District 13, Councillor Lovelace. Yes. 
14, Council Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Council Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Oathead. In favor. One, Councilor Dave Gavin. Voting in favor of the motion. District two, Councilor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councilor Kent. In favor. Four, Councilor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councilor Austin. In favor. Six, Councilor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Seven, Councilor Mason. For the motion. District eight, Councilor Smith. Four. Nine, Councilor Cleary. Yay. 10, Councillor Morse. In favor of the motion. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. Mayor Savage. In favor of the motion, that motion carries. Colleagues, I see uh, Ross Jefferson's joined us, but um, now that you've joined us, we're gonna take a break. Ross, uh, for 15 minutes, and we will come back at 3.15 with, uh, the Integrated Tourism Master Plan. Colleagues, 15 minutes. Ross, don't take it personally that you showed up and we're all leaving. Uh... Not at all, not at all, Councillor. Mm -hmm.
Ian, how are we doing? Well, looks like we are all here except for Councillor Austin and Councillor Blackburn at the moment. Okay, I think we can go ahead then. We do have quorum. We'll send you live here in a second. Thank you. Okay, folks, we are back. February 23rd. Um, and we're going to move ahead with our agenda. We're going to 11.2.1. This is the Halifax Regional Integrated Tourism Master Plan. We're going to have a presentation, I think, from Ross Jefferson. I see Maggie McDonald on. Uh, Maggie, did you wish to say anything uh, first or? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I will introduce uh, Ross to, with the slides. Yeah. Okay, we're all set to go then. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and do we have the, there we are. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Maggie McDonald. I'm the manager of Regional Recreation Services with Parks and Recreation. I'm here virtually with Ross Jefferson, who's the president and CEO of Discover Halifax. I'll introduce the municipal involvement in the Halifax Regional Integrated Tourism Master Plan and touch on its development. Uh, Ross will walk through a general overview of the sector, the impact of COVID, and then through the tourism master plan itself. I'll then close with a few words on implementation and next steps, as well as the recommendation before you. Next slide, please. A little more than a year ago, Regional Council endorsed what we were calling at the time a regional destination development plan and provided funding support to it. The plan was meant to prioritize investments and efforts related to tourism to increase economic growth. The report also identified that there will be staff in-kind resources to support the development of the plan. Next slide, please. The project was led by Discover Halifax with oversight provided by the board. Highlights on engagement are listed here and Ross will touch further on those. Uh, further along in the presentation. And I'll hand it off to Ross. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maggie. If I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ross Jefferson. I am the uh, President and CEO of Discover Halifax. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak with you today. Just before I start, I do want to recognize a few regular supporters uh, of the tourism industry and those that have contributed to the plan, uh, starting with uh, His Worship uh, Mayor Savage. Uh, Mayor Savage has been a long-standing uh, director on the Board of Directors of Discover Halifax and was also the chair of the advisory committee for the development of the uh, regional tourism master plan. I'd like to recognize Councillor Cuddle, the newest director uh, to the Board of Directors and a past supporter uh, in her role with the North End Business Association, as well as Councillor Blackburn, a former director, a great contributor. Um, Councillor, we miss you on the board. And I'd also like to recognize Denise Schofield, the director on the Board of Directors as well. Next slide, please. Ross, if I could, uh, I just want to, um, we're getting a bit of a a, a, a warbling effect on your voice. I don't know if that's on on, on our end or your end. Uh, just so I'm not sure if there's anything you can do to make that uh, go away. Uh, I don't think that there is. I'm sorry, not on this end, but I'll uh, I'll monitor things, and if uh, if it gets bad, I, I'd be happy to uh, skip uh, skip over and uh, allow us uh, allow Maggie a little bit more time. All right, go ahead, sir. Thanks. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, 
just quickly, the, uh, the the Halifax region, the visitor economy here, no surprise, it is a, an important part of our economy. Every year we welcome 5.3 million overnight visitors a year, and uh, it's about a $1.3 billion industry in HRM. Uh, about 54% of Nova Scotia tourism revenues come from the HRM region, and we support around 4,000 businesses and about 34,000 jobs. Of course, these numbers are pre-COVID, uh, and the implications from, from COVID are obviously been quite significant. Next slide, please. COVID-19 has been obviously very difficult on the tourism industry, as well as uh, not just here in Halifax, but across the country and across the world. We are forecasting an 85% drop in visitation to HRM and a loss of about 750 to 850 million in visitor spending alone in 2020. We know there have been heavy job losses in accommodations, food and beverage, tour operators, and of course the meetings and conventions industry as well. Uh, it is impacting revenues, we understand, both for the municipality and all levels of government. Next slide, please. As we presented to Council early in the pandemic, we have a three-phase recovery plan for the COVID pandemic, starting with supporting businesses affected by lockdown. This is achieved through a number of means. Specifically, our organization has been focusing on making sure that there's awareness about local businesses things that were open early in the pandemic, shopping for uh, retail and restaurants locally, and things like uh, the dine around campaigns that you would have seen more recently. We've been turning our efforts early in the pandemic also to reopening and recovery. Gaining access to open safe markets was one of our primary objectives. Uh, and we included a, an opening plan that was submitted to government uh, before the concept of the Atlantic bubble. Uh, and supporting the opportunities for the opening of the Atlantic bubble and beyond. While keeping communities safe and opening to safe markets, we are continuing to look at the opportunities to bounce back better. We're watching opportunities to transform and reinvent, explore opportunities to accelerate the recovery through the plan that you're looking at today, as well as seeking opportunities to reimagine our industry as well as our organizations and the network of partners that we work closely with. The plan that you're receiving today was started in 2019 pre-pandemic and our work finished just before March when the pandemic hit last year. And while it has been said it was a terrible time to try and launch a plan, uh, it was said uh, by our lead consultant it was the best time ever to have a plan. Uh, so we're very proud of the work that's been done. Next slide, please. So what is a tourism master plan and how is it different than other plans? Simply stated, a tourism master plan is a shared statement of work among many partners in a community working towards a shared vision. If you consider for a moment all of the things in a supply chain that must come together for a visitor economy to work, it involves transportation to the destination, be that by air, rail, road, or sea, transportation around the destination, things like access to ride sharing, parking and wayfinding, or public transportation, accommodations, so things like policies on home sharing may be important, not to mention food and beverage experiences and even the design of public spaces. If you consider that one in 27 people in our community on average is an overnight visitor, this is a significant amount of people with unique needs. A tourism master plan is designed to look at the broader landscape from a visitor's perspective, and it seeks to help design elements that support this economic opportunity. But a tourism master plan is also much more than an economic opportunity. It is an opportunity for a community to establish what it wants to achieve from the visitor economy. We know that tourism is one of the fastest growing industries in the world, of course, pre-COVID, and we know that we will have growth with or without this plan. But a master plan helps maximize these benefits for communities and helps guide the growth in a way that we want to see it grow to benefit our community. Next slide, please. At the onset, we embarked on an extensive engagement process to collect input from our partners, industry, and our public. This included three public town halls, including one in Sheet Harbor, St. Margaret's Bay, and downtown Halifax, as well as online survey for residents. And in total, we met with over 30 additional stakeholder groups and many bilateral interviews with our partner organizations. 
This plan represents the collective input from these sessions along with guidance from some of the leading consultants in the world. Next slide, please. We are quite proud of the guiding principles in which this plan has been built, and I won't really speak to the first principle here, which is taking a community first approach. We've all said that this plan uh, will not succeed if we only grow the visitor economy and we don't actually help grow and benefit our community, we are not succeeding. We do believe that a stronger visitor economy can bring benefits to a community, but it is the community first on which the, the principles have been based. Next slide, please. You'll see here uh, and included in your uh, council package kits, this is the framework in which the plan has been developed. You'll notice that the vision is to be widely recognized as a favorite city in Canada. The favorite city is a very de uh, deliberate word. We're not trying to be the biggest. We're not trying to be the fastest growing. We're not trying to be the best. We're trying to be the favorite, which is an emotional statement to the people that we're speaking to. The second is that we're not saying that this is for visitors. This is important for our citizens as well. Being the favorite city in Canada is important for our, for our citizens here as much as it is those that are visiting. Hopefully you'll notice that the four goals are also closely aligned. In fact, they're coming directly from the Halifax Economic Growth Plan. Growing tourism revenues support, supports the overall growth of our GDP. Growing our tourism employment supports the overall growth plan objective of growing employment. Enriching the lives of our residents and aligning with related strategies directly coming from the Halifax Economic Growth Plan. plan. And I'd like to recognize the support from the Halifax Partnership and Wendy Luther and her team specifically on the alignment opportunities. The strategic themes speak for themselves, and you'll notice in the plan that we have 28 active initiatives within these themes. We're happy to take any questions uh, on the conclusion of this um, presentation uh, in a moment. Next slide, please. I'd like to just uh, recognize the supporters of this plan, uh, starting with the members of the advisory board chaired by His Worship, Mayor Savage. I'd like to recognize COA and HRM as funding contributors, as well as HRM's direct support in the plan's development through a number of your departments, as well as with the CAO. I'd like to recognize the support of our many partners who contributed directly to the plan, and a special mention to Michelle McKenzie, our project manager, and Maggie McDonald. With that, I appreciate your opportunity uh, and time today, and I'll turn it back to Maggie. Over to you, Maggie. Thank you, Ross. Next slide, please. Uh, the staff report outlines those strategic initiatives for which the municipality has a lead or primary role, and it describes the status of each of these items. Next steps on individual items will return to Council if and as needed. If Council approves the recommendation, staff would then work with uh, to negotiate with Discover Halifax on a new services agreement and further discussions with HANS, uh, the Hotel Association of Nova Scotia and Discover Halifax uh, to support the direction that's set out in the integrated master plan and the staff. Uh, uh, next slide, please. And finally, this is the recommendation before you today. Thank you very much. OK, that's it, Maggie. Yes, Mayor, that's everything. Thank you uh, very much. I'd like to just, if I could, because I was I was part of this process, the uh, chair or co-chair or something, and I just want to uh, acknowledge the work that's gone into this, which has been phenomenal. Councillor Blackburn would, would know this. Councillor Cuddle would, would know this. Um, this has been work across HRM. Uh, the work that Ross has done to be um, uh, destination marketing for all of the municipality, all parts of the municipality have been really commendable. And during the last number of months, there is no section of our economy that was hammered anywhere near as much as the industry, the industries that Ross uh, has responsibility for. And his unwavering support and his uh, optimism in the face of tough times has been very uh, impressive and inspiring to me personally. And those who were involved in the process will recognize from the beginning, this was, as he said, about not just building people to come here, 
not just to be the fastest growing city in Canada, which we are, or the best city in Canada, which we are, uh, but to be the favorite city for, for a bunch of uh, reasons. But it was about building this community and, and from the very beginning, recognized the impact of Airbnb, the impact of crews, uh, positive and negative things in the community, the recognition of potential over tourism even. These are all things that came out in the process and I was uh, enormously impressed by the work that Ross and Michelle and uh, the folks who worked on it have done. So I want to just, uh, so I need to get a recommendation on the floor. I don't know if I go to uh, Councillor Cuddle as a member of the board or the chair of CPED. I'm looking for some direction. Um, how about Councillor Blackburn since uh, she's a task board member? Councillor Blackburn, All right. on the floor. Thank you very much. And uh, as chair of CPED, uh, I am pleased to uh, move that Halifax Regional Council 1 endorse the Halifax Regional Integrated Tourism Master Plan Attachment 1 of the staff report dated January 11th, 2021, presented by Discover Halifax and the municipalities related responsibilities as noted in the body of the January 11th, 2021 staff report to direct the chief administrative officer to work with Discover Halifax to provide annual updates to Council on the Halifax Regional Integrated Tourism Master Plan. Three, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to negotiate a new services agreement with Discover Halifax to reflect an expanded role for Discover Halifax that includes destination development with the scale and scope of activity contingent on funding levels from all sources, including operational funding from HRM subject to budget approval, Four, request the mayor write to the province of Nova Scotia requesting amendments to the Halifax Regional Municipality Marketing Levy Act to remove the cap on the marketing levy. And five, direct the chief administrative officer to negotiate a memorandum of understanding with the Hotel Association of Nova Scotia in advance of any changes to the marketing levy. I so move. Second, Tim. Seconded by Councillor Outhit and Cuddle. Councillor Blackwood, anything on it? Uh, no, other than to uh, thank Ross and the team for bringing this uh, forward as uh, has already been pointed out. This is an amazing body of work here and uh, it's been, uh, you know, I, I think it's been done so carefully that it uh, it recognizes the uh, the challenges of today, but yet sets forward a path for uh, tomorrow that uh, has a, a brighter tourism future for us all. So uh, thank you so very much to uh, the board. I do miss you guys a lot too. That was one of my uh, my favorite boards was uh, to discover Halifax. So uh, I'll uh, I'll get back there someday. In the meantime, it's in good hands with Councillor Cuddle. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mancini. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ross, thanks very much. Maggie, thank you as always. Uh, truly appreciate the presentation and the work that you do. Uh, you know, Ross, it's, you know, leading up pre, uh, prior to COVID, you had the best job in town. It was easy, right? You had all the all the tools you'd added to uh, bring people to wanted to come here. Now you're really going to earn your keep uh, after this. So, uh, look, and I, and I respectfully uh, thank you for that work. I have a handful of questions. I'm going to give you all the questions, Ross, so, and then I'll, I'll shut up and let you answer them. Um, you know, in saying that, prior to COVID, you know, what were some of the things that really you saw the growth for our tourism? What were the things that were happening that really made a difference? And and now, as we move into the future, ho hopefully after COVID, or we get through COVID-19, you know, what are those needed pieces uh, as we go into this uh, this new area? Because it's going to be a different playing field, right? Because even when COVID and everybody gets their needles and uh, things are well, you know, cruise ships are not going to be pouring back into here, uh, you know, uh, the, the borders are not going to be open, wide open to the whole world uh, just yet. I mean, uh, our events that we, we celebrate and do such a good job of, they're going to come back, but they're going to come slow. So all these pieces are going to be different. It's a different playing field. So I'm just trying to get a sense of, uh, you know, wh you know, what's the focus going to be and how are we going to get people to come here? People are eager to come here. You talked about the partnership, right? The partnership uh, continues to tell us during COVID, 15 new businesses open up shop during COVID, which is remarkable, right? And so I'm looking at, you know, what role does, you talked about wanting to be the favorite city in Canada. What role does being, I think, one of the safest cities in Canada? That has to play a role as we're attracting not only the work the partnership does businesses, but 
people that want to come here. And the last question I have is, could you explain a little bit about removing the cap marking levy? I wasn't as clear on that. What are you trying to accomplish? Those are all my questions, Mr. Mayor Ross. You wouldn't mind? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor, very much. And uh, through, uh, through his worship uh, to you, um, uh, my mute is off. Yes, good. Um, yes, I think the, the answers to your, to your first set of questions, I think really revolves around the, the idea and the premise behind a community first approach. And uh, like I said, uh, you know, we, we had uh, seven consecutive years of growth before the pandemic uh, in mm -hmm. the industry. But the, the tourism industry globally is one of the fastest growing industries in the world. And what we really recognize is that the smart communities understand how to take the growth opportunity for their own uh, economies, but more importantly, to make sure that it's growing in a way that they want it to grow. So really the alignment uh, of, uh, of the, the growth from this industry to the objectives of our community and really the benefit for its citizens. Um, we, we, had the, we have the opportunity to see uh, other communities that haven't been as successful that have let unrestricted growth go or growth go in a, in a way that hasn't been organized or managed. Uh, we can see some uh, subtle hints of that happening here uh, in HRM. Uh, problems in areas when uh, on, on particular uh, big days at Peggy's Cove, as an example, uh, safety issues around that. These are right now very small um, micro problems, and I, and I shouldn't say small in relation to anyone that owns a property in that area. Um, but we've got an opportunity now to, to make a difference, to anticipate this growth and to shape it the way we want. There are tremendous opportunities in our, in our community that don't have enough uh, tourism opportunities. So uh, being able to, to maximize and, uh, and also disperse the growth uh, into those regions is part of the strategy. On your second question, uh, Councillor, um, the uh, hotel levy, as you may uh, and council may not be uh, fully aware, um, we are funded primarily uh, as, a, as an organization through the collection of the hotel levy, levied on hotel stays. 75% uh, of our revenue coming from that source and another 15 coming from our own internal generated sources. Um, we have one of the lowest uh, levies across the country. Um, we have a hotel association that is supportive of us increasing the level of services and for those services to also support a better visitor experience. So today that legislation is provincial legislation enabling HRM to have a bylaw to uh, collect this levy. So uh, the cap today is at 2% uh, and the uh, concept today is to allow that cap to be raised in consideration uh, for a, a discussion about the possible increase of the hotel levy. So on that point, do I have a second there, Mr. Mayor? Very quickly, please. Yeah, yeah, on that point of the levy, so who's not been hit hurt the hardest by this COVID, but the hotel industry, right? So there's there's not a lot of bodies in the hotels. Be, even if you uh, increase it to 20%, there's there's not many there. So what's that transition look like, though? Uh, you know, I, I agree with the concept, but who knows when they're going to be back to uh, full occupancy. Yes, and just very quickly through uh, worship to, to you, the, uh, the the proposal for increasing the hotel levy actually came pre-COVID. Uh, we uh, this is not a solution to the uh, to the downside uh, in revenues that have been impacted okay. uh, from COVID. Um, I uh, am confident that this uh, proposal still uh, has the support of the uh, hotel association uh, quite significantly, and um, I, I understand there is obviously ongoing discussions around that. Okay. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hensby. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and I'm proud to say that uh, Bill number 94, local bill presented by the MLA for Preston, David Hensby, back on November 16, 2001, passed this legislation. So anyway, I'm very proud of that moment of my uh, brief stint at the House. But uh, I know the legislation also permits it to go to 3%. We only have it at 2 I believe, right now. But I believe the legislation allows it to go up to a maximum of 3 I thought. But I have to go back and study that. But I'm advocating that this province should be looking at putting that marking levy across the whole province. I think Cape Breton have it now. It may be Yarmouth. But I think it's only in pockets. And I think that, personally, the province should look at this as have a, a hotel marking levy on all accommodations, be it 1% on the... B and B's and Airbnbs and campgrounds, two percent on the small ends and three percent on the big hotels with, with 100 rooms or more, and that way we spread the crop, spread it across the board, 
throughout the province. So uh, it'd be helpful for a good funding source for the province as well, for the municipality, as well as for Discover Halifax. My question in the presentation today, of course, you also have an online launch, I believe on March the 4th. Uh, I'm hoping that you may want to expand on how the rural economy, the rural tourism economy is going to benefit from this program. I know I have the most beautiful beaches on the eastern shore and we got, you know, we have an iconic lighthouse on, our, on a pile of rocks. We got a fort on top of a hill, but it's the beaches and surfing that goes along the eastern shore are really some of the highlights in, a, in some of the nice trails we have and wilderness areas. So I want to make sure that our rural parts of Halifax are going to be recognized in this tourism uh, program. So can you elaborate a bit more on that, please? So Ross, I'm sure you recognize the voice. If you can't see the face, that's David Hensby from a cave on the eastern shore uh, in the dark. <laughs> yes, thank you. I certainly do recognize that. Uh, Councillor Hensby, uh, a tremendous uh, partner and supporter of, uh, of the industry down there. And uh, Councillor, as you'll uh, be aware, uh, we've had a significant uh, transformation in our organization um, over the last uh, four years. We've actually tripled our membership uh, in four years with most of that growth actually coming from uh, membership uh, in the uh, rural regions. Um, I'd be delighted to speak at the upcoming uh, session on, on the 4th about the, uh, the opportunities and the growth uh, for uh, all of HRM. It is a core principle behind uh, the mandate of our organization and we have a very intentional approach uh, on that opportunity. Quite frankly, we see the, the opportunity for rural and urban to be our strength as a destination and we're leaning in on that, uh, that opportunity. Indeed. Thank you. Ross, I just would add that the new membership system that you have really encourages small and medium sized businesses to be members, not just the, the super large hotels, right? I think that's been an important step that you've taken, which is particularly useful in the rural parts of HRM. Yeah, absolutely. Considering obviously the size of HRM uh, and the number of businesses, uh, the membership for us is really about uh, uh, good governance. In fact, we have dropped uh, our membership fee uh, now to zero. Uh, of course, COVID being incredibly difficult uh, for, for businesses to pay. But the, the real rationale behind it is that our relationship with our members and our businesses brings the strength and our understanding of our communities. With a small team right now, we heavily rely on uh, our members sharing with us their experiences who they are and what they do. And it's really our business intelligence into our communities. So we've benefited immensely uh, as an organization from the increased growth in the rural regions. Uh, and we're, uh, we're, we're continuing to hope to, to grow that more. So you, uh, you're uh, speaking about it today actually uh, helps promote that. And we appreciate your help in doing so, uh, Councillor, and to, to all councillors. Thank you. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you very much, Ross. Um, for the work that you're, you've been doing. I have not had a chance to uh, catch up with you folks since coming on council. I know some of the other new councillors have and I look forward to that. So today is exciting. Um, of course, as Councillor Hensby had noted, we have trails and beaches and surfers and, and all of that within District 3, but uh, equally important if, if a flagship of the Eastern Passage area is Fisherman's Cove. So, um, you know, I, I wonder if you uh, can take a moment to give me a sense of the um, sort of the kind of uh, relationship you would have had to come to this this present this presentation and this this uh, motion now um, in relation to context you would have had at Fisherman's Cove and with the businesses there with the development association um, with uh, the community at large you know we have that amazing gem uh, within a 15 minute bus ride from downtown Dartmouth and a quick a little you know a 10 minute across the the um, ferry to it adds only a little bit and you, you, you don't have to have a vehicle to get there and it's really quite spectacular not only is it wonderful now we've got a really good board I think a solid board they're going concern they've got lots going on um, but you know I still don't believe fully that even within our our local folks know what that gem is out there and of course you when these kinds of smaller entities exist within a, a, a niche, niche area it's really it's a work it's it's a constant constant plug away at keeping it vital keeping it sustainable keeping it moving keeping it um vibrant and up to date so that people want to continue to come there i'm not i, I still don't believe that we have hit our stride out in this area i think there's a lot more opportunities available so I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about um, what you can tell me about your relationship, the relationship that we've had with Fisherman's Cove in particular. 
I do have a question after that, so I'm going to throw it out there. Maybe staff can offer it, um, or you can. On page nine of the report, um, uh, the January January 28th report, it speaks to the operating uh, financial implications, and I'm I'm having a little problem sort of pulling out of that what the potential ask is if there is an ask today for I mean I see the 2021 22 250 but what what those numbers uh, the the larger numbers which have doubled after this year um, just help me understand what that that's all about if you wouldn't mind uh, thank you. Uh, perhaps I'll uh, t take your first question and I'll defer the uh, second question to uh, to Maggie if, and uh, ha happy to help if she needs help. Uh, just very quickly, uh, Councillor, um, the, the, the region, the district, in fact, the, the commission uh, over there has been one of our early strategic partners. Uh, it was one of the areas we were very interested in, in growing our membership so that we could also grow our understanding uh, specifically of the businesses and, and, and the region. Um, we've had tremendous growth in that, uh, that area, but we think we can grow uh, more and we'd love to have the opportunity to work with you to do so. I'd be really pleased to, uh, to schedule a call afterwards and share with you some specifics of what we're doing in the region. And um, uh, again, I, I would echo all of your comments and say it's also just a, a four minute uh, water taxi ride uh, away as well. And through you, Mayor, to the uh, councillor on the second question with respect to the financial implications. Uh, so what you have in that table, the first amount, the $393,000 is the amount that's currently transferred to uh, Discover Halifax. That includes a grant to Discover Halifax, as well as a, uh, a $6,400, I believe, that goes to Destination Eastern and Northumberland Shores uh, organization. The proposal in this report that will be considered through the budget process would is that we would have an additional $250,000 um, in a grant allocated to Discover Halifax on and that would increase on on and that's going forward from this point going forward that increase would uh, would exist um, that starts to bring us uh, closer to where we know that other uh, destination management organizations are although that's still um, quite a bit lower than the funding that we see in other other jurisdictions. So we anticipate that that number may in fact grow. So so what what you see in this report is really that additional $250,000 carrying forward for future years. Um, but as noted in the report, what we would come back with um, sort of once we've had additional discussions with the hotel association uh, is a proposal to council as to what long longer term the municipal investment uh, a recommendation on what the municipal investment should be. So this 250 we would consider as a starting point that'll be considered through the budget process uh, that that council is in right now and then we would come back with a further. further. Thank you Mr. Mayor do I have time for just a quick ask on that? I, so again I'm going to ask the same as where where would that sit within the uh, what's been brought to us so far in the budget allocations. Is this an over or is this in captured with what we've already seen? This will be an over uh, that you'll see in the Parks and Recreation uh, budget presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor uh, Lovelace. Hi, thank you so much for this presentation. I am so excited to get to work on this tourism master plan. Um, as you've you know, already indicated, Ross, uh, you know, we need help. We need to kickstart the economy. St. Margaret's Bay right behind me. Uh, we desperately need to get our businesses back to work uh, to get our communities kind of um, reinvigorated. Uh, and and uh, and get some support for our small businesses and and get this marketing plan up and running ASAP. Uh, I do have a couple of questions um, about uh, the rural and you know tagging on to Councillor Hensby and uh, and and Councillor uh, Kent. You know when I every time we hear uh, Halifax, 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 we think downtown, um, and we're not downtown. Uh, we are more than that. Um, and so trying to think about different ways that we can increase uh, membership because that's really important, the connection. And when I look at uh, the one member uh, that we have in uh, St. Margaret's Bay for Discover Halifax, it, we've got work to do. So Ross, uh, I want to help you. I want to you know, set up a meeting afterwards and have this discussion. 
Um, there's a couple of things I'm, you know, I'm, I'm curious about, uh, you know, where the boat tours, the whale tours, the sailing, the paragliding, the, you know, all of the great things, hopefully a future beer garden and a future uh, bus beach, you know, a beach bus. Um, uh, you know, there, there's so many great things that we could be doing to support the economy of the Bay. Um, so certainly I want to help you do that, but I, I'd like you to speak a little bit about destination development. Um, you know, you, you mentioned it here in the plan. Um, we, we've got a little bit of uh, uh, a rough start with Develop Nova Scotia as far as the destination development of Peggy's Cove, uh, the changes that uh, have happened. Um, you know, I, I, we can learn uh, from that uh, that process that Develop Nova Scotia went through to make sure that we're communicating effectively, that we're involving everyone that needs to be involved uh, with the development of those destinations and really, you know, not picking uh, winners and losers, right? Thinking about the bigger piece and the connectivity. Um, and so then the, speaking of connectivity, the other thing that I'm that I'm missing a little bit here is uh, the bike tourism opportunity. Now, mind you, obviously we've got issues with that when it comes to uh, tourism. Uh, um, oh, it's not tourism and infrastructure, or I mean, transportation infrastructure. I think it's just called transportation now, <laughs> the new department. Um, you know, and thinking about how can we work with the Department of, of Transportation to create uh, a safer roadway for those bikes uh, because there is a huge opportunity that we're missing out on. Uh, for, for bike mar marketing and, and uh, bike tours and all of the amenities and services uh, that go uh, with cycling. Um, so certainly, uh, you know, that, that destination development is really important to me in, in thinking about ways that, that I can work with you uh, to get you uh, and, and your team out into the community to, to really ramp up the membership and, and so people can understand the services that you do provide and how they can, you know, lean on you uh, to get the information that they need in order to uh, get grants, business grants, new businesses up and running and so on. Okay, Thank so. You. Most of that conversation will have to take place offline, but if you want to speak quickly to that, Ross. Yes, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mayor Savage, through you to uh, Councillor Lovelace. Uh, very quickly, I'll just, uh, I'll, uh, I'd like to answer the question around destination development. Today, our organization's mandate is the promotion and sales of uh, the Halifax Regional Municipality. So we have a, a team, as an example, just to give context. We have one individual right now who supports 500 businesses uh, in our visitor experience program. So one individual leading the promotion of the 500 uh, businesses. We obviously have some constraints there. Um, we have uh, three individuals that are responsible for our full marketing program that include everything from national or uh, regional uh, TV campaigns, uh, campaigns working with our partner Destination Canada and Tourism Nova Scotia, as well as all the social media campaigns that we have that promote all of the great regions that we have. We hope that you'll see that the content in those campaigns is really uh, vastly about the entirety of HRM. I think the name of our organization sometimes is highly suggestive that it is, uh, that it is the contrary. And finally, um, I, I will say we have a, a sales team that in the run of a year, we will bid on around 200 uh, events those are sports events and conferences. We work with many partners to do so, and we win about half of those. But today we are a sales and marketing organization. Uh, the investments that are being proposed today actually would help us provide the resources to step into that area of destination development, the things like developing the activities that you've explained, and I'd be happy to do a follow-up. Thank you awesome. for the question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuttle. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and hello, Ross. Um, yeah, anyway, like many of my colleagues, I too am very excited about this plan. Um, you know, I actually, sitting down here in my basement with my bookshelf, I, I pulled out these two documents that I did back in the 90s called um, Tourism and Community Development case studies and an approach. And, uh, you know, it was way back then that, you know, we were talking about how tourism can benefit some or it can benefit many. And I just want to comment that, you know, this community first approach, um, not only is it really smart, it is really, really like super important. It's important not only for figuring out 
um, how, how, you know, I think you've had a line in there that this isn't just an economic opportunity, it's an opportunity for communities to determine how they want to be part of the economy. Um, it's also how you create an authentic product and how you, you know, educate and get support. Um, so, you know, the growth, the growth of the economy, it's not just about the economy, it's about the benefit for the citizens. And um, even now, you know, I see, even though we're in, in COVID and, you know, this, op, you know, like you said, the opportunity right now, I see there's a tremendous opportunity to really look at what that community infrastructure is that we can be working on now that will not only enhance and um, our communities, but will kind of set up communities for success and tourism down the road. So, um, you know, when I talk about community infrastructure, it's not just like kind of roads and, and pipes or something. It's about parks that, um, you know, serve a local need and um, in that also provide an experience for tourists. Um, there's a lot of initiatives happening right now in, in Halifax. Uh, we've got um, the Rural Recreation Strategy. We've got um, a regional economic strategy. We've got um, the regional plan, um, the Green Network plan. We've got a bunch of wilderness parks going on. We've got uh, trails and ATV. Um, as you know, Councillor Lovely said, there's initiatives happening at the provincial level too. So one of my questions is about um, if you can speak a little bit to about how communities will be engaged in this process, because I think that is really important to the success of this plan and um, how the work will be informed by other initiatives in Halifax or the province. And um, yeah, and if you could just yeah speak a little bit to that, that would, that would be great. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Cuddle. Uh, at the very cornerstone of the development of this plan was the recognition that we didn't want this to be an independent plan. In, in fact, it's more of a perspective on the already existing work that's out there. So part of the a significant part of the work in the development of the, this uh, work is around the idea of collective impact and really the destination management approach is about acting as a backbone organization, um, making sure that uh, we are working within the framework of, of already existing plans. So it's not as much as about building a plan, for example, for transportation for tourists as much as it is is making sure that the tourist perspective is considered in uh, the already existing um, uh, plans that exist. So it really is about um, providing resources to your already existing uh, established organizations, including the departments within the within HRM and the alignment between those. The, the exercise really here is about alignment. Uh, it's not about trying to recreate uh, new ideas. It's about trying to, to bring forward the ideas that are already there to, to improve upon them uh, and to have the citizens uh, view per perspective uh, first and foremost. So I think at the cornerstone, it is really about planning uh, something I know is uh, very dear uh, to, uh, to to your uh, to your experience and to your your approach as well. Mm, thanks. Uh, yeah, and, and in that in particular, I just want to mention the kind of the working landscapes that exist, you know, such as wharves and, you know, our fishing industry and our ocean industry and and really how we can work with them to see, you know, a marriage between industry and tourism rather than like kind of a Disney fied approach. To everything, um, you know, I think that that's really important to that authenticity and to kind of the reality in our in our communities. Uh, two thumbs up from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Russell. Thank you very much, and I'm also very much in favor of uh, the work that you do, um, and I'm looking forward to when we can open up again as a community, as a as a province. Uh, welcome the tourists back and get the get the hotel rooms full and 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 see what we can do, not just in Halifax but across the province. And and I think the marketing levy it would be beneficial uh, to everybody across the province if it actually applied across the province. I'm I'm gonna speak on the marketing levy for just a couple of minutes. I, I'm not in favor of uh, what is proposed with the uh, levy being removed entirely. Uh, my my preference would be to uh, write a letter to the province asking them to raise it, but but not remove it altogether. I, I don't think it should be unchecked and I, I, I think uh, uh, we have uh, examples, we've seen them across Canada of where the marketing levy goes from two to five percent uh, generally, 
And so asking for an increase in it makes sense. And, and I mean, th this point might be moot. Hopefully uh, the new premier will will read some of the letters that uh, we submit to uh, to the province. Um, but uh, for this for this marketing levy, I'm wondering if if what it would impact, uh, what would you not be able to do um, if it stated 2% that you would be able to do if it went to 3 or 4%? And what would what additionally would you be able to do if it went higher than three or four percent? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Councillor. Uh, through uh, you, Your Worship, I'll start uh, with this, and then I'll allow uh, and ask Maggie maybe to to join in. Um, uh, simply said, I think the original proposal that uh, was presented by the Hotel Association to uh, your committee, uh, uh, your CPEG committee, um, uh, was actually the proposal for a one percent increase. Uh, in, under that particular model, we had identified destination development, uh, support for events, uh, and the increase in marketing that would support rural communities as the three priorities uh, for that investment. Um, we, we and the board of directors at Discover Halifax uh, really try to take a strong service-based approach uh, where uh, really we, we, we're negotiating a fee for service based on the service levels that uh, you would like to see with us. So with that, maybe I'll, I'll turn this um, the rest of this question back to Maggie and uh, happy to entertain um, uh, theoretical discussions about what we could do beyond a 1% increase. But I will share with you right now that the initial discussions have been uh, around uh, those regions uh, and uh, the models that have been explored today. Yeah, and just further to that, I think those uh, Ross has pointed out the areas where we know we're underfunded relative to other jurisdictions. So those would be sort of the, the key pieces where we would see a need to increase in order to catch up, if you will, to other jurisdictions in terms of what they're doing. Um, more specifically, I think the the services agreement provides the opportunity to um, to I don't want to say dictate, but to negotiate what uh, what that scope looks like according to how much what the funds available are. So we would come back to Council Local Services Agreement that would describe more specifically what we anticipate the scope of, uh, of services are that fits to the level of, of um, funding that we have. Uh, just a final comment on the levy. Uh, certainly we would, uh, the reason that we've um, included in the recommendation, the recommendation that we not proceed with any changes to the marketing levy without a memorandum of understanding with the Hotel Association of Nova Scotia is specifically in order to ensure that we're not, uh, as a municipality, going ahead with a levy that is beyond what the industry thinks can be borne in that uh, in that area. If I could maybe just add to this too, and please uh, correct me if I'm wrong in this, but I believe the understanding is that right now there is provincial legislation enabling HRM to have a levy. There is a bylaw in which I think is under the full discretion and control of council to set what that levy would be. So uh, if there was a, 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 um, a, a perhaps a misunderstanding, this wouldn't be an unchecked uh, uh, opening of a hotel levy without uh, oversight. And in fact, that specific oversight, I would understand, and decision to change the levy would still rest fully in council's hands. My understanding is that's accurate as well. Um, one of the things that I was wondering about, uh, at this point, uh, it is a 2% levy for everybody. Does your funding strictly rely on that 2% levy from everybody, or is there an option for uh, the hotels to be able to pay an additional fee to the uh, to Discover Halifax and receive additional services? So it would introduce uh, something of a different model where there is one fee if you pay the hotel levy and uh, a second set of services if you pay something in addition to uh, to that levy. I thank you, Councillor Steve, your worship to you. Uh, today we do have, we rely about 75% of our um, revenues come from the hotel levy. We receive 60% uh, of the 2% that is collected. The other 40% goes to support uh, SEAC and the, uh, the, the Milsner Fund, which uh, supports events in our community uh, as issued by council. 
um, uh, to your question um, uh, of additional uh, fees, our organization uh, has actually monetized the number of services that we provide uh, to all of our members, uh, and we generate uh, around 15% uh, of our revenue through those monetized services. We used to do that through a monetized uh, uh, membership fee. Uh, we do not believe that that uh, actually works because it actually uh, keeps people out of our membership, uh, which hence really is the governance problem where we're not representing all. So we've uh, we've essentially structured our fees so that membership is free, but the services in which you want to buy or add to uh, come with a fee. And uh, our hotels today probably contribute uh, more than $100,000 a year uh, to uh, to our budget through those types of services today. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to hear that membership is fee, uh, free since uh, People are already uh, paying for it through the levy. Um, Your Honor, I'll, I'll come back uh, with more questions. I see you giving me the eye. Yeah, I don't need to come back if you don't need to. Uh, <laughs> Councilor Mason. You're very kind, Mr. Mayor, to all of us today. Yeah, I hope you don't have cause to regret that at eight or nine o'clock tonight. Um, but uh, Ross, uh, great to see you. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I, I'm glad that this is finally here and I wanna share with council that this is certainly a discussion that the uh, Hotel Association of Scotia and especially the downtown hotels, which probably generate 80 to 90% of the levy, have been talking to us about for over three years, almost four years now. This has been on the radar and, and uh, you know, uh, just to recap, it's, it has shades of the conversation we had about uh, Navigator. This is uh, unique in my experience as, as a counselor, and I think for most of us that uh, uh, don't get used to it, folks. People don't often come here and ask to be taxed more. It just doesn't happen. This is not how things normally work with us. And, and effectively, the levy is a, a collection at the request of the private operators for disbursement to do joint marketing. And, and it, it goes beyond obviously investing in marketing for the downtown core. And indeed, uh, I think uh, Ross was, was quite kind and, and underplayed it. You know, we're, we're approaching 3.1 million visits a year to the waterfront. And one of our biggest issues right now is, you know, in normal times that it's too busy and the quality of the experience could be impacted uh, by continuing to cram uh, more folks in there. So, so what makes Halifax as a whole, all of Halifax an attractive destination is all of the many uh, sites that can be seen and experiences that can be had all around uh, our region, into the valley, south shore, et cetera. So uh, I, I think that uh, I'm really glad to see this here. I know that the hotels have wanted it for a long time. Uh, I know they're very sensitive. Uh, there was some discussion for a while there about a province-wide levy, for example, maybe around a stadium or something like that. And uh, I didn't get a single uh, hotel owner uh, operator who was interested in that because they they need this money here to be able to fund what, what they feel needs to be done as a DMO to be competitive in North America and in the world. Uh, and But they also know that if it gets over a certain percentage, four, four or five, I think was in the range, Range, uh, that it starts to become uh, injurious to their business. So, uh, you know, I, I, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, the kind of investments like are happening at uh, Peggy's Cove with Development Nova Scotia and TIR, I think are the kind of thing that we want to be able to see to levy. Uh, and uh, and that's the kind of thing that this money will be used to help attract people to the region and, and all the other things we're talking about uh, uh, from Fisherman's Cove to uh, uh, Salmon River. Uh, so, uh, very excited to see this here, and I know that, uh, you know, again, as I said, I can't emphasize enough. I always laugh when we're having this conversation because it's the one time businesses come in and ask us to raise the taxes on them. So uh, I will be supporting this, and I'd like to thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Well said. And uh, the only thing I want to be clear about is that that idea of increasing the levy to pay for things like a stadium was a provincial uh, musing. It was never a uh, municipal musing. We were always never, 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 ever, and, or for never. any other municipality, Mr. Mayor. Right. Um, and also, not just, uh, they were also looking at a car rental uh, tax as well uh, for the same thing. That was their idea, not ours. Uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Mr. Mayor, um, thank you very much for the presentation. And one of the things that I wanted to actually give a compliment to is that. For this presentation, the images that are so inclusive of all of HRM, um, kudos, and really appreciate being able to see the breadth of uh, images. And uh, so, yeah, so really nicely done. So I like that. I have.
have most of my questions have been answered, uh, asked and answered by other my colleagues, but I do have a question around the strategic mix of the Discover Halifax board. And if when you're considering that strategic mix of board members, are there or is there a seat that looks around outside of the, the core? Um, so places like the Fisherman's Goal Development Association, would they maybe have one, another one? So I was just wondering around the strategic mix because sometimes, you know, making sure that you have full representation keeps us all grounded. So that's my question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor. It's a fantastic question. A, a tremendous amount of work around governance, not only for the extension of our membership, but for the engagement of the, the communities was put into uh, to, to our selection process. So yes, very specifically, we have, although it's not enshrined in our bylaws, we do have a selection criteria that uh, that, that um, seeks to have members from uh, the regions, all the regions of HRM, uh, exclu including representation of the types of businesses, as well as diversity, uh, a variety of uh, diversity uh, goals that we have. We uh, we're happy to have new directors now that uh, are actually from uh, the Eastern Shore, as well as out in the St. Margaret's Bay region uh, and beyond. So we are well represented from uh, many regions of, of HRM, uh, and that is a significant change from uh, from years past. Thank you very much. If, if I might, just a supplemental. Uh, but I hint in your ear around uh, perhaps social enterprises being a place where you might want to find a rep as well. Uh, I'm sorry, Councillor, I missed the, the question you brought up. Uh, just a comment about maybe consider social enterprises um, in your mix. Yes, thank you. Uh, right now, our bylaws requires um, uh, directors to be members and again this uh, this really does help the more we can extend our membership the more uh, choices we have to meet the objectives uh, that we have for for diversity on our board as well thank you i don't know where council daigle gammon's interest in social enterprises came from uh councillor uh, purdy thank you mr mayor and i've i've learned a lot just hearing this discussion and this is really exciting um and I really appreciate everyone's input. It, I'm it's very good. I'm still unclear about the money. For the next few years, we have the ask here. It's going on, if it gets approved today, it's going in our parking lot to discuss, um, I guess, in debate at the end of the budget season. But this is just the base. There could be more asks on top of this. Is that what I heard? Maggie, you uh, have a Maggie question? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Through you to the Councillor. What we, um, yes, yeah, certainly in, in the early proposal from the Hotel Association of Nova Scotia through to the uh, Community Planning and Economic Development Committee, they identified that there, they had an interest in increasing the marketing levy, but we're looking for an increase to the municipal sort of own source, revenue source uh, contribution as well. Um, in more general terms, we know that our destination marketing organization is funded to a lower level than other comparable organizations. So the $250,000 uh, we believe sort of speaks to a, an expanded ability for Discover Halifax to address, um, take on the, the destination um, management role, but we know that there's still a gap there. So we anticipate in future years that that would, that would increase. Okay, and I'm also wondering about the timing of this um, because this pandemic doesn't seem to be going away and I'm I'm sure like everyone, like just like, oh my goodness, are we even going to have the Atlantic bubble open this year again? What, what happens to your, this organization if we're into this, you know, protectionistic, you know, way for years? What happens if the borders don't open? What happens if we can't get tourists here for years? What happens to the money and what happens to the plan? Okay, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Ross speak to that because I've heard him speak to this uh, almost ad nauseum. Uh, we've had many conversations <laughs> about this. Ross can speak to this. He's a data guy uh, better than just about anybody. But uh, Ross, I think that's a, a a good question. So, what happens to the money if the tourism industry doesn't? Uh, come back. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Your Worship, through you to uh, to Councillor. Um, 
We are uh, tracking uh, right now. Uh, we're participating in, in a number of um, uh, 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 groups uh, globally as well as nationally on the recovery efforts uh, and the expected timelines for recovery from COVID. Um, you know, I, I, I would be, um, I mean, notwithstanding my team and the associates that, that work here, um, I would be less concerned about uh, the organization than I would uh, our destinations. Uh, the, 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 the tourism industry here in HRM uh, employs about 34,000 people. Um, it, it generates about $45 million in property taxes of the businesses that are here for HRM. Uh, I, I'm sure you felt uh, some of the pain uh, uh, from some of that uh, and, and probably will for, for years to come. So my concern about the industry coming back wouldn't be about the organization first, it would be about our communities. Um, I will say though that I am growing in, in uh, gr uh, great optimism. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't call myself a rose-colored glasses person, um, but um, there's really strong evidence right now that uh, the uh, vaccination schedules uh, uh, across the world uh, are going well. Of course, there's always hiccups of uh, months here and there and whether we're ahead or not. Um, I am um, very pragmatic that there are real risks associated with uh, variants. There are real risks associated with distribution challenges. There are real risks associated with immunity and those types of things. But notwithstanding what we know today, we are on track for recovery. We're on track probably for recovery earlier than a lot of people think. Uh, and we're making sure that we're planning for that recovery today. The startup of this industry cannot happen with a snap of our fingers. You know, it takes a lot to get ready. And we are trying to make sure that businesses, governments, and institutions are getting ready for the restart and that we're prepared. Um, there's a lot of people's uh, livelihoods that rest on this, but you know, travel for us is also not just about economics. Travel is the enabler of, of um, a way of life for people, it's for families to connect. Uh, and it, it's it's more important than uh, than just economics as well. I am optimistic, and uh, but the reality is there are risks that, that are out there. Okay, thank you, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just before we go back to Paul, I just want to uh, sort of briefly indicate my support for this if, I ha if it hasn't already come through. I'm spending a lot of time trying to figure out how we as a city actually direct help to those who most need it. Um, you've all heard the statistics that our population has grown over the last year. You've seen the numbers on the labor force that we in fact are the only city in Canada that has the kind of growth in labor for statistics uh, from, from January to January. So some people have done okay, but not everybody. <clears throat> and it's so hard for us as a municipality to direct support to those who really need it the most. And those who need it the most is this industry. It's hotels at 15 to 20% occupancy. It's restaurants with no noontime uh, traffic. It's retailers who support the cruise industry like Nova Scotia Crystal. It is a whole host of organizations that have been hurt. This is a specific way to get help to those who most need it. That's why I support what Ross is doing because it, more than anything else that I can think of, it is a, a role that the municipality can play to help those who've been banged around the most. <clears throat> and in terms of when we're ready to come back, Councillor Purdy, we, nobody knows that for sure. I appreciate Ross's optimism. I think I share it generally that there would be a big risk if, if we did come back and we weren't ready for it. And those businesses that have hurt for over a year would not be in a position to benefit from this if we don't do that. So I think that this is hugely important for the economy. Um, Councillor Russell, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, as I previously mentioned, uh, I would like to uh, speak to the marketing levy cap. And, and I, I don't think that an unchecked amount, I, I, I recognize that it's checked in two places, once at the provincial level and once at the municipal level. Um, but I would like to see us request an increase in the cap instead of uh, simply remove the cap. Um, and, and so with this, I would like to move an amendment uh, that to increase the cap to 4% uh, of the marketing levy. And this is in uh, item four in the recommendation. Would that be up to 4%, Paul? Yes. Up to four percent, because I'm not so sure. So at this that... at this point, the legislation uh, speaks to the cap. Uh, it, it sets a cap at two percent, and I'm looking to increase that cap to four percent. Second, Tim. 
up up to four percent though, right? I think Maggie. Correct, Mayor. To, to sort of mirror the existing legislation, it, the existing legislation speaks to up to two percent. Uh, so, if I understand the councillor's um, motion correctly, it would be up to four percent. It would be and up to four percent, absolutely. Yep. For council to to change the bylaw up to that amount. Okay. Thank you. So this gives us the ability to uh, have the marketing levy set to two percent, three percent, four percent, whatever seems most appropriate. Everything else seems to be fantastic about uh, what's going on, about what we're seeing, about uh, what Discover Halifax is able to do. And being able to provide more ability for them to do that, I think is fantastic. And and so I would simply look for uh, for support in, in increasing it, uh, not in simply removing it. And again, I, I really hope that this new premier will, will take these uh, requests and these letters into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Muted, Sean, you're Sean. muted. And here you, Sean. There we go. Uh, double tap doesn't work on mute buttons. Um, so I would look to uh, Ross for a comment on this particular aspect, but in general, I'm against the idea of us putting any cap on it uh, because there is going to be an engagement process with uh, the hotels, uh, with the folks who are going to collect it. It's not our money we're giving them. It's a levy that's coming from beds. What do they call it? Uh, heads in beds. And uh, it's really up to industry to determine, I think, what the appropriate uh, levy should be. And, you know, we, we may say 4%, they may want three, they want three and a half, four, it, would, it doesn't matter. But I think philosophically, I'm against capping it without hearing from the industry first. And so I would rather go with the motion that we already have, uh, have the discussion and then come back to see where we go from there. So if I could just get a, a little comment from Ross on the appropriateness of four, does that hinder you? I mean, it, it's going to be, there's going to be engagement anyway. Uh, Councillor, thank you through you, uh, through the worship to you. Um, our board, uh, actually, we, we do not have a position on uh, wh whether the cap, there should be a cap or not a cap. I think, um, I, I think your points are well taken that it, it, it really is a question about uh, the, the limits uh, or the considerations of protections or limits, depending on which side of the sword you want to look at uh, for uh, for council itself. Um, but we are um, we are a, a servant to to, uh, to support the desires and needs of council, and uh, uh, we look at it from as a position of a service agreement. So uh, we certainly don't have a position. I'm sorry. Excellent. So, uh, Mr. Jefferson, I expect you to get a call from someone in the federal government soon for a diplomatic post overseas. Uh, that was awesome. But I, I still feel that we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't hinder ourselves or the industry. Uh, allow them to determine what levy they would like to see, and then it would come back to us to and the province to update legislation and our bylaw. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And hopefully you don't get that ambassador post or for, or potentially governor general uh, in the next week or so. Uh, last councillor Mason. Possibly a high wire act of some kind involving. Uh, never mind. Anyway, uh, so uh, I won't be supporting the amendment uh, because uh, I feel like it unduly burdens us with potentially more red tape in the future. We, we have an industry request uh, that we're acting on. We will be in active discussion with the Hotel Association of Nova Scotia before we implement any kind of increase. Uh, the reason we have to even have this debate right now is because it was capped at 2% in the first place. I think that we need maximum flexibility. We'll recognize it's not council's money, and we've had that conversation in the past eight years that I've been here, where we would only raise it at the request of the, ho the people who would be paying the tax. So, uh, you know, I, I don't see what the value of a cap is, given that that's the way we're intending to approach this. Uh, and uh, I, so I won't be supporting the amendment. Thank you. OK, thank you. We had one of the speaker who has uh, chosen judiciously not to repeat the question. So I, ha I have a question, sir. Go okay. ahead. Uh, Go just ahead, to clarify then. Um, Look, I'm in support of asking for up to a 4% cap. I have no problem with that. But if this does not pass and we stick with the recommendation of removing the cap, does that mean we're removing the cap entirely in regards to have a, an unlimited amount or are we getting rid of it altogether and have no levy? Just let's clarify that language about the removal of the cap. This would just be the removal of the cap. It wouldn't mean the removal of the levy. Maggie, maybe you can speak to that. 
Correct. So that would that would leave it entirely at the discretion of council as to what the um, what the levy amount would, or the percentage would be set at. Well, if I was the province, I don't think they'd give us that much latitude. But uh, I think that a four percent, even a five percent, is more reasonable. I sent them on that table of all the other accommodation taxes across the country, and, and I think a four percent levy is probably more than reasonable. So I'll support the amendment. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Russell. Thank you. Uh, just to speak to a couple of points that uh, that were raised. Um, yeah, we, we some of us saw the table uh, that uh, Councillor Hensby sent around. It, it did speak to uh, rates around the country being from 2% to 5%. So this fits within that ballpark. It is still more than uh, is currently being raised. Um, the other one is there were some comments about the association asking for an increase and they have asked for an increase. We have this letter in the uh, in the last few pages of the report where they're asking for 3%. So we could have gone with a an increase of the cap to 3%, but this extra percent to 4% gives us a little bit more flexibility and it means we don't have to keep going back to the province every time we would like to uh, increase it or every time the Hotel Association of Nova Scotia asks us to increase it again. So this just gives us a little bit more flexibility, more than the Hotel Association has asked for um, and, and doesn't leave it unchecked. And that, that is why I would ask for your support uh, for this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. OK, folks, ready for the uh, motion? This is on the amendment. The question on the amendment. Are we ready for the question on the amendment of Councillor Russell as seconded by Councillor Arthur? Question. 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 To the amendment. Beginning with District 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting no on the amendment. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Otit. In favor. District 1, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor. District 2, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. District 3, Councillor Kent. Voting against. 4, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. 5, Councillor Austin. Voting against. There, there's somebody speaking in the background. If you could please mute your microphone. District 6, Councillor Mancini. Against the amendment. 7, Councillor Mason. Against. 8, Councillor Smith. Against. District 9, Councillor Cleary. Nay. 10, Councillor Morse. Against the amendment. District 11, Councillor Cuddle. Against. 12, Councillor Stoddard. For the amendment. District 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting no. Mayor Savage. Uh, opposed. I have six votes for the amendment, 11 against. The motion is defeated. We're back on the main motion. Are we ready for the question on the main motion? Question on the motion. Okay. Beginning with District 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor? 16, Deputy Mayor Otis. Yes. One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. Uh, in favor. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yay. 10, Councillor Morse. Voting yes. 11, Councillor Cuddle. Voting yes. District 12, Councillor Stoddard. Voting yes on the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. Voting yes. Thank you. That passes. Uh, Ross, any final words? No, thank you very much uh, uh, to uh, yourself and to Council. Uh, thank you for uh, your support and 
uh, I'm very happy to do follow up uh, conversations on anything that was missed. Uh, open line. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Maggie, thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome, Mayor. Thank you. OK, colleagues, we're going to move on to 11.3.1, which is on demand private accessible transportation contract. I believe we have a presentation on this. I see uh, Patricia Hughes. So I'm assuming that that would be you, Patricia. That is. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Patricia Hughes, manager of planning and customer engagement with Halifax Transit, and I'm here to talk about private on demand accessible transportation. So next slide, please. The recommendation is that we procure an on demand accessible transportation service uh, for consideration as part of the upcoming budget process. Next slide. A bit of background on existing accessible services. Uh, there are public transportation services, which includes conventional transit. As you may know, all of the conventional transit fleet are now low, low floor accessible. Now there's also Accessibus, which is a door to door shared ride service for those who are unable to use conventional transit. And there's also private accessible transportation available in the municipality, which includes accessible taxis, which are door to door on demand service at a metered rate as well as accessible charter services, which are contracted service at a fixed rate by the provider. Next slide, please. And we've certainly heard in the past, there's been a number of discussions about the number of accessible taxis and the availability of accessible taxis. And there's been an acknowledgement that there is a higher cost of operating accessible taxis. Now, part of this is because of the capital costs. An accessible taxi vehicle is normally a van with a ramp, uh, converted to have a ramp, and those cost more and have a shorter lifespan than other vehicle types. Uh, there, there's also higher operating costs. The larger, heavier vehicles tend to consume more fuel. They have more moving parts, which can result in more maintenance costs. Uh, we've also heard uh, from the industry about extra time to pick up passengers. The fewer accessible vehicles on the road means that you're traveling further to pick up a passenger. There's increased time and kilometers spent with no paying passengers in the vehicle. Uh, and as well, there's additional time assisting passengers uh, and activities such as deploying or stowing the ramp. So all of these have, have led to increased operating costs for accessible taxis. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and there have been a number of previous efforts to support accessible taxis and increase the availability. Uh, this includes the provincial funding program uh, called the Accessible Transportation Assistance Program, which at one point did fund taxis, uh, although it doesn't at this current time. There was also a previous proposal that uh, some, some councillors may remember to change a bylaw, the bylaw to require all new taxi licenses be accessible. Uh, that didn't move forward. And there was also previous requests sent to the province to amend the HRM charter to allow the municipality to provide grants uh, to purchase or convert vehicles or to provide a subsidy for accessible taxi license holders. And there was also a request to be permitted to charge TNCs, which is transportation network companies, a per, a per trip fee to allow funding for accessible programs. So despite these previous efforts, there's still concerns about the availability of accessible taxis. Next slide, please. Which is what brings us here today with a new proposal. So the objective of this program would be to establish a framework to ensure that accessing on accessing, sorry, to ensure that accessing on demand transportation services for those with mobility devices is really the same experience as as those ambulatory passengers. So that means in terms of vehicle availability, how you book your trip and the cost, uh, how long it takes the vehicle to get to you. It's really the same, it should be the same experience whether you have a mobility device or not. So that's really the goal. Next slide, please. So to achieve that, staff are recommending that the municipality procure accessible transportation services. So this means we'd enter into a contract between a provider and HRM the provider would be responsible for providing private accessible on demand door to door service to clients and charge them the standard taxi rate. Uh, and they would also receive revenue from the municipality at a rate agreed to through the procurement process. So the municipality would essentially be paying to have the vehicles available to provide the service. This model is intended to address the current obstacle of vehicle availability by increasing the financial viability for the provider and so that they can have the vehicles ready to dispatch. Next slide, please. 
One of the key aspects of the contract would be the establishment of service standards. And so through preparation of this report, we did engage with a number of key stakeholders uh, and people with an, an interest in this project and established that standards would need to be included uh, that outlined span of service, level of service, geographic service distribution, uh, reporting, dispatch technology and training. So if approved by Regional Council and if, if direction is provided to proceed with this, it would be our intent to conduct more public engagement. Um, we've really just spoken with key stakeholders at this point. So to speak with the public more uh, and, and get more thoughts on these standards to help refine and develop them so that they can be included in the procurement process and the standards can be clearly outlined to the vendor. Next slide, please. I also just want to identify one of the risks uh, raised by stakeholders. There's certainly concern that if we if we uh, are looking for a vendor that there's not one vendor available that can fulfill all the requirements. Um, the plan at this time is still still to, you know, if, you know, pending council direction, it would be our desire to proceed to look for one vendor, but just recognition that if we're unsuccessful, it would require adjusting service standards while still maintaining the intent and changing strategies to look at multiple vendors. But at this point, the proposal is to look at one vendor and multiple vendors as a bit of a backup plan. Next slide, please. Just in closing a bit about cost and timeline, um, there's obviously uh, still work to be done on this, uh, engagement to happen uh, and a procurement process that needs to happen. But high level estimates at this time, we would expect that at least five to 10 vehicles would be required uh, for the demand we're hearing about, which would put us in the range somewhere between 280,000 and 600,000 a year. Um, the variability is really because it, it will depend on who is interested in providing the service, if they ready, what their startup cost would be. Uh, this cost also includes a full time staff member to internal staff to administer the program, to work with the vendor to resolve issues and to undertake ongoing monitoring and reporting back. So if approved today, the funding amount estimated for the fall 21-22 uh, would be included in the proposed Halifax Transit operating budget in the upcoming process. And if if approved and brought forward, uh, we think the earliest potential startup date is going to be late fall this year. The timeline, of course, uh, can vary based on the amount of time it would take to, to negotiate a contract with the vendor and how ready they are and if they have fleet available and, and the timelines associated with that. Uh, but at this point, that would be our best estimation is late fall 21. And next slide, please. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. We appreciate uh, that. I will go to the chair of uh, TSC, uh, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On behalf of the Transportation Standing Committee, I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to include the procurement of a, an on-demand accessible transportation service as outlined in the January 7th, 2021 staff report for consideration as part of the Halifax Transit 2021-2022 Budget and Business Plan. I so move. Second, man. Second. Dr. Mancini, go ahead, uh, Councilor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, uh, you know, a little bit of history on this, because uh, I've been here for a lot of the kind of contemporary history. Um, uh, when we were faced with the idea of uh, doing what they called all accessible in the fleet, uh, it would have meant that uh, new uh, vehicles would be coming in based on when uh, a licensed cab owner replaced the vehicle. And so there was no way to kind of guarantee how fast that would happen. But if, it, if you know, theoretically every six, six, seven years, you'd see all the cars turn over. And the issue is that a Dodge Caravan with a lift in the back is our kind of standard approach or was our standard approach uh, or possibly one of those Ford Transit vans. And they cost a lot more money than buying a three or four year old Corolla. And uh, and then on top of that, we you know we started to hear back from different groups that seniors and amputees and people who were suffering uh, uh, some kind of debilitation that weakened their legs found getting into those kind of vans, especially the transit vans, not so much, but the Dodge vans, uh, a real problem. And in fact, uh, one of the providers, Casino, sent us information that uh, they had ten times the requests for do not send a van as send an accessible van. So so that placed us in a position where we'd potentially be asking people to get a low floor van that costs 40 or $50,000. And then you just see the capital cost going up and up and up of having a single integrated fleet. Uh, and you would then have to be talking about having a much higher uh, fare uh, 
in order to sustain that capital cost or a grant for everybody. So it became this huge mess of like what happens first. And that's why we've landed on this approach, which which I support of establishing a funded, uh, supported, uh, financially supported uh, wheelchair accessible uh, uh, service. Uh, I think that that makes the most sense to find a way to contract that out and support it. And I guess my question for staff is there's that variable rate in there and you spoke to it a little bit. Uh, it's five years between, uh, I think it was about a quarter million and 600,000, give or take. Uh, so I'm assuming what we're imagining is, is that, you know, hopefully in an ideal world, someone comes forward and says, I'm going to buy 10 uh, tr uh, Ford Transit vehicles, put the chairlifts in, and I'm going to, and this is what it costs for me to do that, that they're going to build in the amortized capital cost of that capital expense over the five years, similar to someone buying a, you know, a Newson, a Wacker Newson to clear a sidewalk or something like that, that they expect will only last five years. Like, is that what we're seeing? We like, we're, because I've had questions from people in the community saying there aren't enough accessible taxis to provide the service, even if we subsidize it. But I, I think this is going beyond that, isn't it? That we would actually be expecting that we would be subsidizing it sufficiently that, that they would be able to buy the equipment required to do it. Is, is that the case? Uh, yes, certainly in response to the question, that is what the high end of that range reflects. The lower end would reflect someone who, who may have vehicles available and, and don't need the large capital expense at the onset, but that the high end reflects the scenario you're suggesting. Okay, well, we can all, always hope for the best, but I'm not going to hold my breath. So thank you. I do support this. I think it really is in a city our size uh with the uh, population uh that we have i think this is the best way to go forward i, I really do and i'm glad to see this here uh, thank you staff for bringing this forward thank you mr mayor thank you councillor blackburn thank you very much mr mayor and uh, patricia thank you so much for uh, for the presentation uh, as you know like councillor mason i'm thrilled to see this come forward this is something that uh during my time on the Accessibility Advisory Committee that uh, has been discussed and discussed and discussed again. Uh, I'm also glad to hear that the public consultation is going to continue, that this isn't a, a one and done situation. But I do have, uh, you know, uh, has this been presented to the Accessibility Advisory Committee? So that's my first question. And certainly as we have tackled this problem uh, over the last few years, um, this, you know, we have written to the province asking for charter changes to uh, allow us to work on this problem for a long time. I just want to make sure that I'm clear on this. What we are voting on today does not require any changes to the uh, the charter at all. We don't have to write a letter to the province. We don't have to get permission. This is a completely made in Halifax solution, and uh, and we can move forward on this without any other orders of government pulling strings for us. I see John Traves's face has appeared. Uh, so the John. second question, yes, that's correct. This essentially would, would look to continue the availability of a private accessible tax. Okay, excellent. Thank you. excellent. And on the, excellent. on the accessibility advisory committee, Patricia? Yes, we didn't present uh, to the committee be uh, just because of timelines, but they were all invited to participate in the stakeholder engagement and then a few members did. Um, and I, you know, I think as the public consultation uh, process continues, I would suggest that uh, that you do take this to the accessibility advisory committee to uh, to get their their input and, and thoughts on that as well. But uh, otherwise, I love what I see here. I'm a happy camper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Just to clarify for the public's uh, interest. Uh, when people first hear this, we're not replacing accessible bus service. This is just a private uh, step up, I guess you could say, for for uh, accessible vans to be out there in the in the private sector for the taxi industry. So I want to make sure that's a clarification for the general public. When some, some people ask people, "This is a, you get rid of the accessible buses?" And I don't believe so. This is more of a a, a, a leg up for the. Um, for the private providers to get the expenses of putting out one of these type of vans or vehicles on the road, as well as um, I want to make sure that as we buy new buses in our fleet, we're still going to have that low floor capacity pickup availability. So our buses are going to be accessible as much as possible. Uh, so I just want to make sure that's still part of our mandate as well. Confirmation of those, please. 
I see David uh, Regan has joined Patricia Hughes. Who wants that one, David? Uh, I, I can take that one, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Dave Regan, Executive Director, Halifax Transit. Um, through to Council, uh, th th thanks for that question, Councillor Hensby, because uh, that is a point I really do want to um, have the opportunity to drive home today that um, th this is in no way a transit service. It's not a service that's replacing excessive bus or anything like that. Um, it, it basically comes down to the municipality looking to provide a consistent, reliable, accessible tra taxi service. Um, and at the end of the day, the folks best positioned to manage that contract uh, are us at Halifax Transit. Just we are the one we're, you know, within within HRM, we're the folks that are most uh, most familiar with operating a transportation service. So that, that's why it's fallen to Halifax Transit, but it's not a transit service and not um, intended to replace excessive bus in any way, shape or form. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to clarify that point. And then to your other uh, other question, yes, um, you can actually really only buy low floor buses now. So all of our buses going forward will continue to be low floor accessible. OK, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. A couple a couple quick questions just to, to clarify the last piece. So this would be the procurement for Halifax Transit to, to manage this program, like our Accessible Bus, not replacing it, but like our Accessible Bus program? If I may, I think a better way of putting it would be that you're contracting for a private accessible taxi service, which is distinct, obviously, and would be administered, sorry, by Halifax Transit, which okay. is distinct from a public shared ride service, excessive bus, right. or your large public transportation system. So contract. So, are so similar to if you know our our uh, solid waste or anything along those lines, where it's we contract the service. It's not us, but okay, got right. It. Okay, yeah. that was that was so. It's not so a service we provide. Right, right. So, so two pieces to that. One is I didn't see in the report, and maybe it, it was there and I missed it, but other models across the country um, that might be doing this, uh, municipalities uh, or even other uh, other places in general. Because I, I have two reservations. So I support this overall. I, I want to make that clear. Support this. I think is important, and 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 I don't want that to to get across. So my concerns are um, not not seeing that in the report wondering if if we have a clear understanding of if this model actually will work and solve the issue that we're hoping to solve uh, with the, the lack of accessible transit for those who need it the other piece of it is uh you know doing a procurement uh before we go to the public in in as of now uh, not seeing what other models are i would just be fearful that we do a procurement in in not fully understand what if what we're asking for is is the best approach to move forward. So I'm just wondering if you as staff feel confident that before we do public engagement and, and before we understand other models, is going to procurement now the, the best way to move forward. Sure. So just for a little uh, a little bit of clarity about the process. So the intent would be to do the engagement to help inform the procurement process so okay. it, it wouldn't come after. Um, the other part of that is with other models. So we certainly did uh, do jurisdictional scans. We looked uh, at many cities. Um, we didn't find this model, to be honest, uh, and I think it's because we didn't find our unique challenge. Uh, the cities, you know, we found some interesting models, but they were in cities where there were plentiful accessible taxis already and those were being adapted and subsidized in different ways. So with the unique challenge here being the availability of the uh, accessible taxis, we, we didn't come across that. So um, certainly did a, a bit of research on that, but uh, it, I, I can't say that it's a proven model anywhere that we could find. Right. So if we approve this today, um, would that stop us from from also using our social procurement policy because it's before April 1st, or can that still be used because you're, as you said, you're not going to do the procurement rate when we approve, if we approve this today? That's correct. So the procurement wouldn't start until after the operating budgets are approved, um, which would be after April 1st. Okay, so just, just, just to be clear, um, if this gets approved today, we'll, when we do procure, Procure this. We'll be using our social policy framework 
with the procurement. That's correct. Awesome. Yes. Okay, great. Um, the last piece is really just a comment. You don't have to respond to this. You know, it would have been great to have that per trip fee for Uber, but we don't have that. And I understand we have to do the best we can to support the residents who, who need it. So hopefully in the future, maybe we can look at that per trip fee. But I do, I do know if we did have that, we'd, we'd have some money in the bank to support this right away. So thank you, staff, for all your work and look forward to seeing what comes up in the future. Thank you. Councilor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, David, Patricia, thank you as always. You know, we've, you know, colleagues, we've come a long, long way in this municipality when it comes to accessibility uh, service. Uh, when I first got elected, and I, Patricia and Dave, you heard me say this many times, when I would speak to a resident that either they used the service or a family member used the service, they couldn't have that conversation unless there's a tear in their eye. And we've done some great work, and I'm proud of the work that we've done, and we still have more work to, done, to be done when it comes to accessible uh, service. Uh, I'm very supportive today uh, of what's on the floor. I do want to share with you, uh, all colleagues and Dave and Patricia, a conversation I had with a resident yesterday. He's 73 years old. Uh, he's been in a chair for a wheelchair for 30 years. He's been independent all his life. And just recently, because of his health, he had to give up his vehicle. So he said on Sunday he needed to go to the hospital. It wasn't an emergency, but he needed to go to the hospital, uh, and there was not one cab available to take him, an accessible cab to take him. He told me, uh, you know, he's been locked up a lot because of COVID and finally went out a few times with friends and then couldn't get an accessible tag, a cab to take him home. His friends had to take him, lift him out of his chair, put him into their vehicle to take him home. So unfortunately, we hear this story over and over again. And all of us in council and staff here, none of us know what it's like to live life in a chair. We really, really don't. Uh, and for us, we're so fortunate and we take that for granted, our mobility. So this is extremely important. One of the questions I had, you've already asked, uh, you're, if it passes tender, you're looking hopefully late fall, which is fantastic. I guess my question is, you know, what are these people, what do these clients do in the meantime, where we have the gentleman I spoke to, 73 years old, this still has that challenge. Our accessible bus service, I understand, is we are going to that almost the next day service. Is that not correct, Patricia? Where are we with that in our accessible bus and, and that quicker service? We went from you know, having to book it seven days in advance, long list. We've gotten through that and we've improved that. And again, I compliment you and your staff for that. So where are we with trying to shorten up? What does this, this resident do and other residents do in the meantime that needs that quick access to that mobility uh, concern? So I, I can take that one, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to council. So the uh, work does continue on the accessible bus continuous improvement plan. And when I when I come forward with my team with our budget and business plan presentation to council next month, we'll have more details on okay. uh, the work plan for that for the upcoming year. Um, two things I would say. One is that we've been attempting everything everywhere we can to fast track this, recognizing that the, the need has been uh, has existed for a long time and uh, trying to do everything we can uh, to move it forward as quick as possible. Um, the other piece is that um, in terms of accessible bus capacity, you know, right now with COVID, our accessible bus ridership levels are dramatically lower. So okay. we are we are very 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 few trips are being denied. I think I saw the statistics for the for uh, for the uh, for I think it was December December or January. And I think there were four trips in the entire month we couldn't provide. So um, you know, not. I would never want to say anything about a silver lining with COVID, but we are certainly yeah. not seeing any trip denials right now because of the low demand. David, what, how? So, what's the earliest uh, if someone needs a service? Uh, what What is the the standard today? How uh, they need to book it? How well and far in advance do they have to book it to access us? I mean, we would certainly say as, as far in advance as you can. But as of right now, if people are booking within a day or so, they're typically going to get their trips. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Patricia. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Diggle Gamma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, one of the things I, I actually support this hands down, and uh, one of my questions is how will we define user? Um, will there be, because sometimes disability is uh, not an obvious disability, so some persons may need the use of this kind of a service. They don't use a walker but they do need assistance. They are vulnerable in one way, shape or another. So I'm wondering if there, those persons would have to just self-disclose or would there be a registry, something like that, I wonder. 
And just on the most recent point um, on the usage and the demand of excessive bus, is part of the low demand the fact that there is reduced passengers per bus and therefore there's not as many people being able to get to, for example, if they are attending a social enterprise, medical appointments, or for social engagements is. I, I know that I've, I've heard that in the excessive bus, the, the amount of persons that can be on a bus has been reduced just for social distancing and, and all that kind of stuff. But back to um, this proposal, um, yeah, just how will we define user? I do know that there are a lot of persons that are homebound um, and could really use this service, but they may not meet a definition or they may not use a wheelchair or a walker, but they are vulnerable and in need of the service. Who wants that? I'll take that one, uh, Mr. Mayor. And I, I mean, certainly the, the need that's been identified that we've heard has been about mobility devices and, and not being able to um, to use a standard sedan type app, uh, but I and, and I mean we still have work to do through engagement to further define exactly any uh, requirements under the RP. But my expectation would be that the, the program is focused on people for that for any reason can't use a standard cab and need an accessible taxi. Um, that that would be the intent of the program. I don't. We wouldn't have any desire to make it really stringent or have any kind of database or anything like that. The focus is really just someone, anyone who's not able to use the existing system uh, to make it available for them. Thank you. And maybe I, I can I can take the question uh, on accessible bus. So er, early in the pandemic, uh, Mr. Mayor, through your early in the pandemic, we did um, reduce capacity across all of our services, uh, but those are back to normal now. Uh, they're back to full capacity uh, with the mandatory masks and such. So, um, so that that so that doesn't have an impact. I think it's just uh, it, it's similar to the entire transit system. We're seeing decreased demand for all services. So I think that's what's driving it on the accessible bus side as well. I did see uh, Aaron Blay pop up. Did, was there something that uh, you want to add to it, Aaron? Uh, sure, thank you very much. Aaron Blay, Supervisor of Service Design and Projects at Halifax Transit. Uh, just to build on what Patricia was saying is one of the intentions of the program was to um, acknowledging the fact that not everyone has a visible disability or is able to register or perhaps uh, they might only have uh, the requirement for an accessible cab maybe a couple months a year. This is available to the public, to anybody. Um, when someone calls to request a cab, they would just note that they require an accessible vehicle and that's that. Thank you. Councillor, you good? I'm good, thank you very much. All right, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you you just uh, sort of get to the crux of it, which is, um, you know, policing uh, whether or not someone, you know, has a has a disability if they have, you know, visual impaired, uh, if, if they're uh, just uncomfortable, uh, you know, I just I think it's really important for us to recognize uh, that we just need to provide the service, uh, you know, with the service boundaries, though, uh, you know, with that transit service boundary, obviously, especially with excessive bus, we're hearing a lot uh, of issues of excessive bus not being able to get. Uh, to the areas, Hammonds Plains, outside of Hammonds Plains, we've got a gap between service, uh, you know, between the excessive bus boundary and the Bay Rides boundary. Uh, so, you know, there are there are real needs in the community of individuals that just that we have nothing to access. So I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit to, um, you know, the, the process uh, for getting uh, the license up and running. Like, I'm, I'm just thinking the timeline. Certainly, we're going to do some communication in the community and engage uh, with, uh, with the community and the current service providers, uh, you know, with the nonprofit groups, the current uh, for profit groups. But, you know, what about the utility and review board and actually permitting uh, this, this processing and the licensing? What's the timeline for that, Patricia? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think part of it, you know, this could go one of several pathways, uh, depending on what the proposals are and, and what vendors are interested in it and what their vehicle size is. So um, certainly uh, there there will be requirements to be met, whether through the utility review board or the taxi bylaw or what have you. So um, I think that will be the bulk of the timeline. We do expect that, um, you know, we were estimating about about 10 months uh, and 
probably six of that is the vendor making sure that they have all of their requirements and licensing in place. Yeah, so I, I was just trying to get a sense of, of, of when this we could potentially envision this uh, actually coming to life and, and being able to service the people that need it. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. OK, colleagues, I think there's uh, that's the speakers. Are we ready for the question? Question. Yes. Question. question. Beginning with Liddell first, since he's yeah, got to go. Councillor Smith first. Beginning with Councillor Smith. Appreciate that. Thank you uh, for the motion. District 9, Councilor Cleary. Yay. 10, Councilor Morse. In favor. 11, Councilor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councilor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Councilor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councilor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councilor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Outhead. Absolutely. District 1, Councilor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. 2, Councilor Hensby. Affirmative. 3, Councilor Kent. In favor. 4, Councilor Purdy. Voting in favor. 5, Councilor Austin. In favor. 6, Councilor Mancini. In favor of the motion. 7, Councilor Mason. For the motion. Mayor Savage. For the motion, the motion passes. Thank you, Patricia, David, and Aaron. Colleagues, just before we take our break, um, I would like to uh, do the, before we do the notice of the motion, does somebody want to move the in-camera minutes if we don't need to go in, in camera for those? Councillor Cleary would move those. Second. One moved by Councillor Cleary. Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Stoddard. Stoddard, thank you. Um, we can just vote by uh, voice on that, I think, folks. So you, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The minutes are carried. Uh, I will uh, go to uh, notices of motion as well while we're uh, here. Uh, if people are ready, if people need time, let me know. Um, Councillor Mancini on a notice of motion. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move first reading a proposed bylaw S612, amending bylaw S600, the Solid Waste Resource Collection and Disposal Bylaw, the purpose of which is to, one, place the municipality in a leadership role to address an issue of concern for residents and businesses, two, reduce the burden on victims by holding more offenders accountable to remedy cleanup, and three, heighten the profile of enforcement activities to deter future violations and activity of illegal dumping and littering. Thank you, Councilor. Here, 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 here. Sir, Sam Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to propose amendments for approval to Administrative Order 2020-004 ADM, the Procurement Administrative Order and Administrative Order 2018-004 ADM, respecting real property transactions, the purpose of which is to provide the required authority for municipal capital projects to begin at the earliest possible opportunity in the new fiscal year. Thank you. Councillor Cuttle. Mr. Mayor, um, take notice that at the next meeting of Halifax Regional Council to be held on March 9th, 2021, I propose to move a motion requesting that additional information on prioritizing the clearing of snow from the main sidewalks in school zone areas from P3 to P2 be included in the supplementary staff report requested by Regional Council on September 29th, 2020 regarding sidewalk snow clearing standards for residential street walkways. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? All right, colleagues, we will take a break and we'll be back at six o'clock with a public uh, hearing, uh, following which we will go in camera for a couple of uh, items. Mr. Clark, have I missed anything? Just a reminder that the public hearing starts at six o'clock and it will be in your evening calendar invitation. Do not return to this one. It'll be in the one for this evening. 
Everybody good? Take an hour. Come back ready to go. Less than an hour. <laughs>